global events, and especially in our interconnected world, will not be our last. The better informed we are of the nature of these events, the more likely we are to be able to cope with them. The focus of the uh, Union of European Perinatal and Neonatal Society and Hippocrates webinar series on this pan pandemic will be its effects during pregnancy and early childhood. Since this is a, a complex topic, we have divided it into three sessions. The first session today is to provide a better understanding of coronavirus bio biology, the SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis, and the fundamental mechanisms of the placental barrier to maternal fetal transmission of viruses. The second session, which takes place on October 22nd, will discuss considerations during pregnancy, the newborn period and childhood, including lactational period. The third session, which takes place in two weeks, will focus on public health and social aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially as it, is a global, you know, as it is a global perspective as it relates to children and families. Uh, since this is a global problem, it will require global efforts for its resolution. We have thus made the best attempt to gather individual experts from various parts of the globe to work together as a team to discuss this problem. It is our hope that this conference will stimulate unified efforts to address this issue we will be discussing. I want to underline the fact that we have 87 different countries participating today in this seminar. So to begin this session, I would like to introduce the chairman, uh, Dr. Richard Condit, who is Professor Emeritus from the University of Florida. Dr. Condit is a highly respected virologist who has made numerous contributions to the field of virology. Professor Condit designed this first session of this webinar. Although formally retired, he's remained very active and recently is a frequent contributor to a very popular and informative weekly YouTube series called TWIB, This Week in Virology, coordinated by Dr. Vincent Razzanello from Columbia University. I listen to it very often during the mornings when I go on my morning, morning walks and runs. It's very informative. At this time, I will turn this conference over to Professor Condit. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Joe. And uh, thank you, Corrado. Uh, I welcome this uh, opportunity to uh, contribute to the global understanding of the pandemic. Um, this, as uh, Joe has already said, this first session is devoted to uh, the fundamental understanding of the uh, biology of the coronavirus and its uh, pathogenesis and to the uh, maternal fetal uh, barrier to uh, infection. And I think we have a nice lineup of uh, three speakers who will address those uh, topics in succession. Uh, we're gonna do the three uh, talks uh, in succession with uh, no pause in between, and then we're gonna have a discussion uh, following the last where people will have an opportunity to uh, submit questions and we'll have a panel discussion with the three speakers and myself to try and uh, address the questions. So without further ado, I wanna introduce our uh, first speaker who is uh, Matthew Freeman, who is an associate uh, professor in the Department of Immunology, uh, Microbiology uh, and uh, immunology at the uh, University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, Matt did his uh, PhD at Johns Hopkins University, uh, followed by a postdoc at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And his research goal is to create therapeutic interventions for viruses of public health concern by developing a detailed understanding of how viruses interact with the host. His research is focused most recently on the highly pathogenic coronavirus, uh, SARS, uh, MERS, uh, and SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, he's uh, also an expert in developing uh, animal models for uh, testing uh, therapeutics for coronavirus infection. Uh, so we welcome Matt to talk about the uh, biology of SARS-CoV-2, Matt. Hi, Rich, thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Um, hopefully everybody can hear. Um, so today, my job is to uh, give you a little bit of background on coronaviruses, uh, their replication and, and life cycle. Um, that'll be followed up by Lisa Grilinski, uh, Dr. Lisa Grilinski from uh, University of North Carolina, where she'll be talking about the uh, 
pathogenesis and therapeutics of this uh, of this family of viruses, especially SARS-CoV-2. So, um, as Rich said, my uh, I'm a associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, um, and uh, my lab really started when after a postdoc at Ralph Farrick's lab at UNC um, in the U.S. working on SARS-1, and now we have been through two other epidemics now, SARS, uh, MERS coronavirus, as well as SARS coronavirus 2 now. And what we've been doing over time is now layering our understanding of these viruses on top of each other to really um, make a response faster and faster. And I've, you've seen for um, the SARS coronavirus 2 outbreak, the amount of research and the amount of understanding of these viruses has been exponential as more groups are uh, working and more groups are understanding how these, how these replicate and cause disease. And so, um, I don't think I have to give too much background on our current outbreak before I get into the basics of coronaviruses. But um, as you know, the, the, during the current outbreak of SARS coronavirus 2, there are hotspots that are continually emerging around the world. Um, in the United States now, we have a extremely high uh, number of cases with hotspots all over the country, um, uh, over 50,000 cases a day and around 1,000 deaths. Um, so it still is not abated in, uh, in the United States as we get into winter. Um, and just highlighted on this slide is uh, several other countries, um, including France and the UK, that are in the midst of their outbreaks now, where they're starting to shut down regions of the countries again, um, as they did earlier in the spring when this virus was emerging for the first time. Um, uh, this is also true in in, in Germany as well. Um, in China and Japan and, and many South um, in, in many Asian countries, we are seeing that they are able to control this virus in a variety of means, and, and hopefully we can learn from the ways that they are working out the control with the rest of the world. In the United States where we are, um, there's been a remarkable number of hotspots uh, around the country, um, especially in the Midwest to the, the middle of the United States. There are large areas where there are increasing amounts of cases um, uh, still ongoing now. So this is a, um, a, a map over the last 14 days in the darker red is the um, increased cases that have caseloads by the county level um, in the United States. And as we look just in the United States, again, we're getting over 50,000 cases again in this um, now new new rise and in curve of um, infections and um, as we go into the winter in the US. And so we are expecting there to be a really a rise in cases as we go through the fall and the winter um, as we get into respiratory virus season with normal colds and flu increasing. So um, the basis what I'll tell you about today is that is really for the basic biology of these viruses, the more that we understand about how basic coronaviruses, the, the seasonal coronaviruses, as well as the highly pathogenic coronaviruses replicate, um, the, it leads us to our better understanding about SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and then the faster we can develop therapeutics to combat this uh, known virus now, the, the um, SARS 2, as well as the new emerging viruses in the coronavirus family, which we uh, don't even know exist yet, but are clearly going to um, uh, emerge over the next uh, decades. Um, we now are at three coronaviruses that have emerged um, from zoonotic sources in the last 18 years, and uh, this certainly will continue into the future. Uh, so we'll take a, a bit about this virus, kind of pull it apart. We'll look at the virion structure, how the genome uh, is oriented and works, as well as understanding replication cycle of the virus. Um, each of these really leads to therapeutic development, and we can understand better and get to those therapies uh, faster as we understand more about this family. So just a bit of a breakdown about these viruses, um, uh, coronaviruses in general. They are, um, are a nidovirus in the order. They're the, the new genus names for the, for the SARS and MERS family are sarbecoviruses. Um, this includes the SARS coronavirus 1, MERS, and SARS coronavirus 2, um, initially called uh, 2019 NCOV. Um, the virions of the, this family of viruses are um, enveloped viruses. So they have a lipid membrane on the outside of the virion, um, generally uh, circular and spherical uh, format. On the right here, you can see an EM of the virions. This is SARS-1 on the right-hand side. The viruses are studded by these spike proteins, these lollipop structures on the surface of the virus. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. That's what binds to the receptor on the surface of cells for SARS-1 and SARS-2, that's the angiotensin converting enzyme. Um, we'll do more about that in a minute. Um, the middle of the virion is filled with the, the nucleocapsid um, in these red boxes covering the genome, um, but it's really a spherical virus. And we'll talk about all these bits in, a, in, a, um, in the next couple slides. Uh, the other thing is that as we work on these viruses, 
all of them in the lab, we have, the, and we work with these viruses in the lab, they're all BSL-3 viruses. So biostate to level three is what we call it in the United States. Um, we have to wear a full uh, Tyvek suit and papper um, with resp respiratory protection over our heads and a, a filter around our waist. So um, we work on these in a safe manner. Um, uh, and honestly, I think as anybody who works on these viruses will tell you, uh, I feel the safest when I'm working, I'm suited up and working in the BL3 where I know where the virus is rather than being outside in the world where we don't know where the virus is, but we know it's around us. So um, we'll break this virus apart now, showing you the virion. Again, this is a, a new cryo-EM structure um, uh, the, of the virion itself. Um, and so we'll kind of take the pieces apart. So this is kind of together. If we look at all the bits, um, you can see there is a lipid envelope around the outside of the virus. It's an envelope virus, as I said. Um, the, when we get to the replication cycle, you'll see how this is formed during replication. Um, but this is what encompasses all of the um, all of the important information is included, um, embedded in the vir in the envelope or included inside the virion. Also, on the surface of the of this lipid membrane, you have in the E protein, the envelope protein, at low level in this um, in the virion itself. Uh, this is important for uh, we believe is important for for uh, release of the virus and acidification potentially of the virus from the endosomes as part of its replication cycle. You also have the M protein, which is um, in purple here on the right-hand side. This is what coordinates, it's also in the lipid membrane. It coordinates the internal structure of the virion, um, which is bound to the nucleocapsid and the genome. And so if we go inside the virion here on the right, on the bottom left, um, all of this uh, lavender color are nucleocapsid proteins that are wrapped around the RNA genome. That's a 30,000 base pair RNA genome. And that coordinates the inside structure of the virion kind of similar to like chromatin and DNA inside of a nucleus to compact this together. Um, and then you have the RNA genome, which is 30,000 bases long, single-stranded RNA virus. Um, that's bound by the nucleocapsid as part of its formation in the uh, replication cycle and um, is coordinated inside of this virion, which is then the nucleocapsid is bound to the M protein um, and it's captured during replication inside of the cytoplasm of uh, infected cells. And then on the outside of the cell, you have the spike protein, which is, um, as I showed you before, is uh, dotted on the outside. It is what has the, it binds the receptor on the surface of cells. Um, uh, and there's been really beautiful crystal structures of this spike pr protein as well. And so there's, uh, if we zoom in on the spike protein itself, which is kind of a, a major target for therapeutics and vaccines and antibodies, um, there's been really beautiful cryo-EM. Um, the panel, the picture I'll show you here were pulled from uh, a New York Times article just recently where they pulled a bunch of articles uh, of stories together from different cryo-EM structures. Um, on the left here is a cryo-EM of the pre-fusion state. So what happens during replication is that the spike protein gets modified, um, gets cleaved uh, by proteases, which we'll talk about in the replication section. And then uh, you have this conformational change. So this is the pre-fusion state where you have this long stalk um, uh, as a, a during that's embedded in the envelope. Um, the lipid envelope of the virus, uh, and it's formed as a trimer. So this is actually three spike proteins together um, that form this trimer with a, um, a, a three stalks together as part of this. On the tips of the virus is the, or the spike protein or the receptor binding domain or RBD. Um, this is the immunodominant antigen on the spike protein. This is where uh, monoclonal antibodies are generally directed when you start generating the lab looking for neutralizing antibody um, as therapeutics. Um, and the RBD, the receptor binding domain, is what binds to the receptor in the case of SARS-1 and SARS-2 and NLC3, another human coronavirus um, that gives you a common cold, it binds to ACE2. And so at that interface right here, um, where these red arrows are, are where the ACE2 binds uh, the spike protein. As I said before, there's this common stalk, which is essentially hidden um, by a lot of the, uh, a lot of the structure during, um, during entry. And this is covered up after the fusion state happens when uh, the spike protein is cleaved and you get this dramatic change in, um, in the conformation of the, vir of, the, of the spike to allow for fusion. And what's been really dramatically uh, shown here on the right-hand side is what it, the, the structure looks like after it has been uh, formed in a cell and during glycosylation, um, uh, during formation of the virion. And so you get this dramatic glycosylation and these sugars that really cover much of the surface of the spike protein. And what we're understanding now, and this has been identified before, but really these, with high resolution cryo-EM, you can really see the structures of the sugars um, in the great detail. And there's really an entire sugar coating covering the spike protein. And that, um, 
is really important for vaccine design and antibody design, where you're now looking for nooks and crannies where the antibodies can bind to the spike uh, for neutralization, but um, are not affected by glycosylation, or you incorporate the um, glycosylation in the targets that you're looking for when you're looking at monoclonals, so you can really allow for the protection um, to be more in vivo-like, and so you can, uh, the type of antibodies that we make in humans. So all this together is really important for entry of the virus into cells and engagement of the receptors. If we look at all of the spike protein, uh, all of the spike proteins of different coronaviruses here on the left-hand side, um, just divided by their genus, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second on the phylogeny uh, uh, slide, uh, the spike protein is generally in the same format, where you have the N-terminal domain, which is what binds to um, uh, the sugar potentially on the surface of cells, where which in, helps engage the receptor, um, the, the spike protein. But also you have the uh, region that binds the receptor, and all of, all of the orientation is fairly similar between all the different coronaviruses that we know of in the same uh, structures. And on the right-hand side here, there's been a lot of crystal structures done on previous coronaviruses, um, SARS-1, MERS, NLC3, and um, a porcine coronavirus, uh, PRCV. And all of them have the same similar structure, um, but you can see in red here, that's where the um, that's where the structures are engaging the receptor. And all of that um, that specificity is built into this receptor binding domain that really engages the receptors. Um, as I said, the receptor for SARS-1 and SARS-2 and for NLC3 is called ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, this is another really amazing cryo-EM reconstruction showing the virion binding to ACE2 on the surface of cells. Um, this engagement is essential. If you don't have ACE2, you really don't get infection of cells. Um, so you need to have ACE2 in the target tissues where you're going. Um, there clearly are other factors that are important. Um, and those are either at entry factors or post-entry factors that allow for efficient replication of the virus. There's been a lot of study recently on where ACE2 is expressed in cells as people are, are now looking for other tissues that are involved with pathogenesis, which you'll hear from um, uh, Dr. Galinsky. Uh, and so if you do single cell sequencing of the, of the ACE2 expression across uh, human tissue, um, what you can see is that lung is here right in the middle and there's relatively kind of moderate level of ACE2 expression. There's, there's large amount of ACE2 in, in heart and in kidney and intestine. Um, all these tissues, we didn't see infection of, of SARS-1 in these tissues uh, very much. There's really not NLC3 infection in these tissues either, um, but there is now SARS-2 has been found to affect these other tissues, especially the, 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 um, the gut where we know that you can shed virus um, uh, through the gut as well as uh, heart complications and the role of how ACE2 is expressed in these tissues and whether there really is live virus in these areas or it's an inflammatory response is something that's ongoing. Um, but even post-entry, there's clear role of cellular proteases, other transcription factors and immune proteins that are important for affecting and, and rep, uh, the replication and disease state of the virus. So now if we zoom in on the genome structure itself, what we know is that the, all the coronaviruses have the same basic structure. It's a 30,000 base pair genome. Um, with the five prime two thirds of the genome here, this isn't really drawn to scale. This is about 20,000 bases for all the replicase proteins. These are made as one long open reading frame um, that is then translated into two different ORFs, uh, ORF 1A and 1B, with a slippery site in the middle where the ribosome frame shifts. Um, and these non structural proteins, as they're called, are then cleaved by two internal proteases that are encoded by the virus. So. NSP3 and NSP5 encode two different proteases, and those uh, cleave this polyprotein into different set of different pieces, which allow for the individual replicase proteins to do their jobs during infection. The three prime end of the genome is the, where the, um, the structural proteins are, the spike, the E, the M, and the N protein that make up the virion. Um, and then what is uh, also known is that in, in between all of these structural proteins, all the different coronaviruses have different sets of things called accessory proteins or, or virus-specific proteins. Um, and each of these proteins uh, in the middle of, these, um, of the structural proteins is involved with all different types of pathogenesis effects and pathways. So they can be interferon antagonists, they can affect um, cell cycle and all different types of aspects of, the, of taking over the cell. If we look at a lot of different coronaviruses in, uh, together, again, you can see this common structure coming out where the first 20 KB are the replicase. Uh, in yellow here on the left-hand side are the proteases. Um, uh, the RNA polymerase, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is here. 
um, shown in yellow in this larger box, as well as the helicase. And all of these are replicase proteins, which, which are essential for replication of the virus. And then similar buildup and structure of the spike, the structural and the accessory proteins shown on the right. One of the really amazing things about coronaviruses uh, um, is that they are really large RNA viruses. The NIDA virus and the, um, and the coronaviruses are the largest RNA viruses that we know of. Um, and there's a clear evolutionary jump between the smaller um, sets of, corona, uh, of viruses that go to maybe 15 kb, as uh, jumping to the NIDA virus lineage and the Tora viruses, where you now see the 30,000 base pair genomes. And the addition of this, um, uh, the ability to add this much new information to the RNA genomes is really due to a, uh, what's been recently identified, is due to a proofreading activity of the polymerase. And so this um, uh, uh, NSP14 protein that's encoded in the RNA, uh, in the NSPs, is a proof, has proofreading activity. And this is work done by Mark Dennison's lab and Ralph Barrick's lab showing that if you mutate the NSP14, you now can increase the immunogenic capability of the virus. Otherwise, it actually is a quite um, uh, uh, has much reduced in, uh, mutation rate during infection uh, when you compare it to other RNA viruses like flu or HIV. So we look at phylogeny of these viruses. This is an old graph, but uh, um, old phylogeny. But I like how it kind of displays these uh, the the viruses that we know of. Um, the woman here sneezing is pointing to all of the the um, the viruses that give us a cold, the, the human coronaviruses. So you have HKE1, OC43, uh, 229E, and NLCT3 over here on the right-hand side. And they just give you a common cold during the winter, and we get those every year. Um, if you look at now the highly pathogenic coronaviruses, we have MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, up here in the upper left, um, and SARS coronavirus 1, uh, when this was made, it was just SARS coronavirus, um, shown here on the right. And these are different viruses, but they're in the same beta or Sorbeco coronavirus lineage. And what we know is that SARS-2 is a very similar virus to SARS coronavirus-1 um, in its basic uh, genome sequence, uh, but it is a derivative and a new virus out of those out of that lineage. If you look at an updated phylogeny here, um, blowing up basically what we know about the this new uh, coronavirus, and when this one this figure was shown, it was originally called 2019 NCOV. Um, you can see SARS coronavirus-1 at the top. Um, and then the, this new coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2, shown here in the middle. So while they are in the same kind of lineage and clade of the tree, um, they are different viruses and they have different uh, um, origins after they came from animals. But you also you can see that in the middle, there's a huge amount of bat SARS like viruses. And so after SARS emerged in 2003, there was a huge uh, um, uh, research base now looking for the amount of viruses that were, that were found in bats. And we found, uh, people found all of these SARS-like viruses that are shown um, here. The other really kind of interesting thing that we know by the phylogeny is that um, the samples that are shown here are the original ones that were identified in the Wuhan seafood market outbreak. Um, and they're all almost identical to each other, to, to, the, to the nucleotide. And so what this tells us is that there probably was a, um, a super spreading event that occurred in this market. Um, uh, this virus is already adapted well to humans, and it looks like it was probably a human spreading it at the market, not an animal human jump. The animal human jump seemed to happen uh, several weeks to months before we all knew about this virus in the in the winter of uh, 2019. The other really kind of amazing thing that's going on um, out of this outbreak is that there's been incredibly rapid sequencing that's a, that's uh, been um, ongoing since the beginning of January. And so this is just a a, a picture from a website called Next Strain. Um, where Andy Rambaut is now analyzing all of these genomes as they come online. And so there's a lot we can learn from this. I won't go into all the details. Um, the colors correspond to the, the location that they were identified in the, in the country of the continent of origin. Um, but there's a couple of important things here. One is that we know that mutations occur. You can identify the different viruses by their SNPs. And so they correlate with their location by the number of, of small changes that occur in the genome. But there's no winning lineage yet. There's no massively evolved virus that is either super pathogenic or super non-pathogenic that we're not that we're seeing. They all seem to be uh, the similar versions of the same or original virus. Um, they also seem to have all come from a common ancestor on the left hand side here, which is the original site in, in Wuhan. Okay. Um, 
So that's your uh, basics on vi virology of the viruses and their, their uh, genomes and structure. Um, we'll go a little bit now through replication of these viruses because there's really kind of interesting things that, the, that coronaviruses do during replication. And so we'll, we'll take all these steps in part, but as the virus rep enter, enter cells from the membrane, there's uh, important transcriptional um, differences that these coronaviruses go under. They induce really interesting structures in the, in, of, for replication foci on these double membrane vesicles. And then the virion forms in the, um, as the structural proteins go through the ergic and the virus vesicles are made and then fused into the cell to release the virus. And we'll kind of go through the steps a little bit. So we look at the entry phase of the virus. Um, as I, sh I showed you before, this, the virus has to engage the spike protein on the surface of cells. Um, we now know that there's another protease, there's another protein on the surface called TMPRSS2 or TEMPRS2 that is involved with cleavage of the spike and allows for the activation of the spike and a, and a conformational change so that the, vi the virion can fuse to the membrane. This can happen either at the plasma membrane itself or inside an endosome. So you can get internalization of the spike and ACE2 complex into an endosome inside of a cell and then the fusion event happens there. Um, and there's interesting dynamics depending on the cells you used, whether it's a TEMPRS2 driven uh, cleavage event or it's a cathepsin driven cleavage event which occurs inside the endosome. But either way, the goal is to get the genome into the cells. As we look at the machinery, um, as I showed you before, the, the spike protein is cleaved. It, re it releases or, or um, exposes the fusion machinery as part of the spike protein that then brings the membranes close together of the virus and either the endosome or the virus and the uh, plasma membrane. And that fusion event allows for the genome to get into cells. Uh, once the virus is in the cells, there's this really remarkable uh, transcriptional process that goes on um, where the virus makes a thing called subgenomic RNAs. Um, and I won't go over all the details, but what it bas the virus basically does is it has a, um, uh, it's a positive sense RNA virus where now you get uh, subgenomic RNAs made on the negative strand, which then allows for jumping of the, of the RNA to the very five prime end of the genome to add what's called a leader sequence. And so, um, What's really interesting at the end of, of the whole transcription cycle is you get uh, this ladder of RNAs that are made all with the same five prime end, but now with uh, different amounts of the rest of the genome added. And only the very first ORF um, that's encoded in each of these subgenomic A's is made into the viral proteins. The rest of the RNA is kind of there as a carrier. Um, and it's not really understood exactly why the virus does it this way. Um, there's probably important information in three right of the genome that the, is important for the virus either to evade the immune response or to uh, engage better replication. The other really amazing thing this virus, that these viruses do, which a lot of uh, viruses do, is, is uh, manipulate the lipid machinery in a cell. And so coronaviruses make these things called double membrane vesicles where the replication machinery is made and sets up um, on the membrane. Um, and what we know now is that uh, and this has been getting better and better over the years as people are getting better cryo-EM structures, but we know now that there is um, RNA inside the vesicles. And so the replication happens by shooting, by, by uh, making the, the genome inside the vesicles, which is then released through this pore on the vesicle to release the, virion, the, the viral RNA out of the vesicle. And so this is very new. This is, there've been better and better pictures of this over the years, um, but it looks like this is really what's happening inside during coronavirus replication. So the other really important thing about all of this structure is that um, uh, is that the virus has to, when it replicates in cells, there is an entire machinery of the virus that is important for engaging the immune response and, and affecting the immune response of the cell. So while we showed here that the virus can take over the lipid machinery of the cell to make all of these um, convoluted membranes where the replication machinery is setting up shop and you get um, um, uh, effects on trafficking and other parts of the cell that are now being taken over by the virus. Um, you have a whole host of replication proteins that now are made and are form this replication complex that is sitting on the surface of the membranes. Um, the other part here is that the innate immune response that is leads to an antiviral response is trying to fight the virus at the same time. And so uh, we've known for a while that there are proteins that are able to inhibit the replication, the innate immune response during infection. And so these have been mapped for a bunch of coronaviruses um, and between SARS-1 and SARS-2, a lot of these are homologous to each other. Uh, the, 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 the viral 
proteins that are involved in replication actually have a role in innate immune response uh, inhibition as well. So PLP is a the papine-like protease. It's encoded by the um, NSP3 protein at the beginning of the uh, ORF1. That uh, we know that blocks IRF3 and um, IRF7 um, nuclear import and and activation, as well as NSP1, which is a, seems to be a, a general degradation factor for a lot of host RNAs, which is being figured out. We know that there's the accessory proteins, um, ORF3B and ORF6, um, that affect the uh, trafficking of proteins into the, into the nucleus that are going to turn on the standard interferon uh, machinery to make interferon that's secreted from these cells. Um, and then what we know also for ORF6 is that once interferon is, uh, is secreted from cells, it binds to type 1 uh, interferon receptor, which is then allows for um, a whole signaling cascade through STAT1, STAT2, IRF9 for um, the infected cells to turn on a whole host of hundreds of other interferon stimulated genes as antiviral responses. Um, the ORF6 protein actually inhibits the nuclear import of these factors by binding up the import factors. So as a generalized block in nuclear import. And so really what the amazing thing between all of these viruses in the coronavirus family is they all find ways of altering the host response, whether it's lipid modifications, whether it's innate immune trafficking or taking over other aspects of the um, cell cycle. And so the viruses have evolved ways uh, and evolved proteins that engage all different aspects of the, of the cell in a variety of pathways. Um, and eventually the virus replicates to such a level that you can overwhelm that the that you overwhelm the immune response, so you can you can um, cause disease. But then eventually the immune response can take over um, the infection as well, and you get more of the adaptive response. So there's this balance and and evolutionary arms race between the virus and the host to um, to affect replication. Um, and so all aspects of this replication cycle are really important for uh, both understanding more about the virus, but also for therapeutic development. And so as we now look for, um, uh, for therapeutics, whether they target the entry of the virus, the replication machinery or other host factors, um, the more we understand about how these viruses replicate, the better that we can understand about how to develop therapies to them, both for um, this virus that, that is now emerged, but also for future coronaviruses as they come. Um, and even broadly speaking, as the more we understand about how coronaviruses work, we can now develop broadly acting antivirals that engage not just the host factors that the coronaviruses interact with, but we identify host factors that are common between many viruses. And by targeting those, we may be able to develop broadly acting antivirals, which we really don't have many of, um, for uh, the viruses that we, we don't even know about, not just coronaviruses, but other things as they emerge in the future. Okay, so all in there, and hopefully you learned a bit about the coronavirus virion structure and the genomes um, between all of the coronavirus families, not just SARS-2, um, how they replicate, and then um, uh, how these are important for therapeutic development and pathogenesis studies, which Dr. Rulinski would tell you about. So I'll, send it, let, I'll leave it there, um, and uh, hopefully everyone stays safe and follows all of our recommendations for um, uh, protecting yourself by distance and uh, wearing masks and washing hands and surfaces. Um, and then I'll leave, I'll end it with this slide, which is the slide that I always give uh, in my grad student lectures. I end with this for the last 10 years. And um, all of this is basically still things we don't know. We don't know when another coronavirus will emerge. We don't really understand yet how SARS and MERS and now SARS-2 cause much disease, although we're understanding more every day. Um, we're, what is the best type of therapy and how do we get there faster and quicker and, and stronger? Um, and then what is gonna come up next? And, and uh, the more that we understand about what all the bits of the virus do, does, the better we can understand uh, for this coronavirus. Okay, so I'll end there and uh, please uh, come up with questions uh, after we're all done. Thanks. Excellent, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so that's the basic uh, coronavirus biology. I'm um, uh, motivated to say that uh, all of these talks are being recorded and will be available on the websites for the sponsoring organizations uh, for, uh, I think, indefinitely following um, this uh, webinar. So uh, all of that information is available for you to uh, review at your leisure. Our next speaker who will talk about coronavirus pathogenesis is Lisa Gr Grilinski who's an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of uh, North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, Lisa 
did her PhD at the University of uh, Michigan and then uh, went to University of North Carolina to Ralph Barrick's lab uh, to continue her studies on uh, coronaviruses where she is now an assistant professor. Her research interests are in the interaction of highly pathogenic human coronaviruses with the host immune system. She's interested in how these interactions lead to the res resolution of virus infection or alternately lead to virus-induced immune-mediated uh, disease. And uh, we welcome Lisa to talk about the pathogenesis of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection. Lisa? Great, thanks so much, Rich, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, from around the world. This is a really impressive global group. So as Matt alluded to and Rich just said, I'm gonna be talking about the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2 in people. I spend a lot of my time at the University of North Carolina studying what happens in mice, and we see a lot of similarities, but uh, ultimately, what we care about is how everything translates into humans, how we can better understand this disease and develop antivirals and therapeutics to improve patient outcome and hopefully end this pandemic. Uh, Matt and I actually overlapped as postdocs for a few months in Ralph Barrick's lab at the University of North Carolina. So even though we can't see uh, friendly faces in person at conferences this year, it's fun to uh, end up at the same meetings online. So as Matt said, emerging coronaviruses are not a new thing. We've seen a number of them really over recent years, but the original four uh, mild human coronaviruses are also thought to have emerged from uh, animal populations and based on phylogeny research spread into humans over the past several hundred years. However, in the past 20 to 25 years, we've really seen an increase in this, and some of this is because of our ability to detect new viruses. And some of it just seems to be that there are more of these zoonotic events happening. So in the last 20, 25 years, we've had six coronaviruses emerge from uh, animal populations into either humans or uh, pig populations and cause significant disease. And SARS-CoV-2, the cause of COVID-19, is obviously uh, the most prominent of these. And this trend really seems to be continuing with accelerated cross-species movement. And so we think this has a lot to do with changes in global ecology, increased contact between humans and animals, uh, contact in habitats that previously humans weren't being exposed to. And so because of this, it's really important that we understand uh, what's happening in coronavirus pathogenesis, what's allowing these new viruses to emerge into human populations, and what commonalities they have in terms of disease presentation and outcome, what can we learn for uh, better optimizing treatment. So if we think all the way back into January, which feels like decades ago and not just 10 months ago, uh, it was really actually New Year's Eve, January 1st, kind of depending on where you are in the world, that people first started to hear about these new pneumonia cases happening in Wuhan in China uh, for anyone who wasn't already in China. Uh, I was on vacation traveling with my husband and saw it pop up on Twitter from some pretty reputable science writers. And so anyone in the field, our interest was kind of peaked. Lots of messages started to go back and forth, but there was minimal information. So what we first knew was that there were clusters of pneumonia cases, a lot of them associated with that seafood market that Matt mentioned in Wuhan. And then there was some silence and we started to hear, okay, there's a, a case that popped up in Thailand. So travelers are getting this virus, bringing it around. Uh, it took a little while, you know, a couple of weeks, but eventually uh, China and the WHO acknowledged that there did seem to be human to human uh, transmission happening in mid to late January. And at this point, you know, that's incredibly obvious with tens of millions of patients as part of this pandemic. But, you know, not so long ago, we really knew very little about this disease and how it developed. And then by the end of January, uh, you can see on this graph here that cases in, in Wuhan in particular and throughout China were really exploding. So our early information about what the disease course looked like really came from 
uh, patients in Wuhan, limited data that was coming out. Uh, and some of this was because of access issues, but a lot of it was because the city was overwhelmed with patients and trying to respond to a totally new disease that they were unprepared for, had difficulty testing for, and definitely didn't have uh, the hospital capacity, the resources, the medical expertise uh, to deal with. And then as the year went on into March and April, we saw cases popping up in Europe, uh, Italy and Spain early, later on, France, Germany, the UK throughout. And of course, in the US, we've had a really remarkable disease progression where uh, cases just continue to spread uh, really out of control. Uh, and you know, India, Brazil, also nations that are suffering from incredibly large COVID-19 outbreaks. And as we head into the winter months here in the Northern Hemisphere, there's definitely a lot of concern about the way that this will proceed. So if we look at coronavirus cases in people, what kind of disease they're experiencing, what the risk factors are, one of the things that became evident very early on in the outbreak was that age is a major risk factor. So this is data from uh, early, early in the spring, looking at cases in uh, South Korea, Spain, China, and Italy, mostly because those were the countries that had enough data at that point. Uh, this type of analysis could certainly be done again globally. And I think it would show the same type of information. And this is that uh, children, you know, especially young children, uh, middle schoolers, teenagers, typically have very mild disease. There have been fatalities and they are kind of especially sad in these younger people, but by and large, uh, people under the age of 20, even under the age of 40, typically experience more mild disease, more likely to be asymptomatic. Once you get to 50, 60, 70, 80 plus years old, uh, the risk of mortality increases dramatically. And we think this has a lot to do with immune senescence, how the immune system is able to recognize, respond to the virus. And also older people tend to have a lot more comorbidities, which we also know are incredibly important risk factors for developing lethal disease. So again, this data is from earlier in the outbreak, but I think holds true where individuals who have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, hypertension or high blood pressure, and cancer. So anyone with an underlying condition, even if it doesn't seem that bad, I think there are a lot of people uh, who are a little bit overweight or have high blood pressure who would think of themselves in good health, but they really do have an increased chance of developing uh, lethal disease. So when we initially think about COVID-19 and the disease it causes, uh, especially early data out of China, we thought of it as pretty strictly a respiratory disease. We know uh, from the literature and from Matt's great review earlier that corona coronaviruses infect uh, type 2 pneumocytes, alveolar cells, uh, ciliated epithelial cells lining the large airways, and it binds to ACE2 uh, to allow entry and replication in cells. So here's a cartoon of alveolar spaces in the lungs of, on the left, a healthy human, and on the right, uh, a person who's experiencing acute lung injury uh, leading to ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. So normally you have this nice open airway, the alveolar space, you have circulating alveolar macrophages that are just surveying the landscape, ready to uh, identify bacteria, viruses, anything that doesn't belong, uh, present antigen, uh, let the rest of the immune system know what's happening. Type two cells, type two pneumocytes here are responsible for uh, producing surfactant, which is really critical for lung function. Type one pneumocytes, much thinner, line the alveolar walls, and then you get up to the conducting airway where you have the ciliated epithelial cells. And nearby you have vasculature with uh, blood circulating and allowing for gas transmission. If we think instead about what's happening in the lung of someone who's experiencing acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, perhaps a COVID-19 patient, we instead see a whole mess of a situation. 
So there are a lot of inflammatory cells that have come in uh, to the lung. We have monocytes, we have lymphocytes. All of these cells are secreting cytokines and chemokines. A lot of neutrophils might be coming in. Uh, there's vascular leakage happening, deposition of fibrin, in severe cases, hyaline membranes form. And all in all, this results in a very, very damaged lung where either you tend to head towards a pulmonary fibrosis phenotype or you tend to head towards a kind of drowning phenotype. And as if that wasn't complicated enough, we have all of these other factors involved in coagulation pathways, uh, cell damage response. So in general, we know that the situation in the lung is very complicated and it's a very, very delicate balance. If we imagine the seesaw of pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory factors, uh, pro-fibrotic, coagulopathies, everything happening in the lung all at the same time. And this is why it's really important to catch disease early and why it's much simpler to treat disease early in infection. If we think about the typical timeline for COVID-19 presentation, a new patient, we've seen very repeatedly from around the world that the incubation period seems to be on average about five, five and a half days. However, it can range uh, from two to 14 days from the time of exposure until someone presents with symptoms. There have been occasional cases where it seems like it goes even longer than 14 days, but at that point, it's much more difficult to determine if there was another exposure that someone was unaware of. So if someone does present with symptoms, initially they tend to be pretty mild, it might be a fever, cough, uh, some general fatigue. There can be GI symptoms, aches. Uh, people don't need to have all of these, however. Fever and a cough are pretty classic symptoms. However, there are a lot of patients who don't experience these. A notable mild symptom has been loss of the sense of smell and taste. So if people feel a little bit off and have a new loss of taste or smell, then that is definitely a sign that someone should go get a COVID-19 test. More severe symptoms, sometimes they don't develop. However, they're not gonna develop right away. You're usually looking at seven to 10 days, time for the immune system to really kick in, uh, cause damage, cause inflammation, and lead to more severe symptoms, such as difficulty breathing, chest pain, uh, really low oxygen levels. Uh, this is experienced in a much lower percentage of patients, but it can be very severe. So it can be difficult to determine how many patients are actually truly asymptomatic. It requires follow-up to make sure that someone who is uh, diagnosed and interviewed and presents as asymptomatic initially actually stays asymptomatic and doesn't just turn out to have been pre-symptomatic. However, it's become very clear that even asymptomatic cases can still shed and transmit virus. And this is not something that we anticipated early in the pandemic. I definitely remember talking to a number of people, uh, Matt and others on this call probably had the same situation saying that we've never had asymptomatic transmission be a big driver of virus spread. Well, we'd never had a coronavirus pandemic before either, and we're dealing with a lot of new situations this year. So in this case, we do know that asymptomatic, or at least pre-symptomatic transmission is an important driver of the spread of disease. We think that's about 20% of patients. Uh, the majority of patients have either this mild disease or asymptomatic. So about 60% of patients have really mild disease, maybe some fever, lethargy, that loss of sense of taste of smell I mentioned, even possibly a mild pneumonia. It's been really surprising to doctors looking at x-rays and CT scans that patients who are walking around feeling pretty okay sometimes do have signs of mild pneumonia. A further 15% or so of patients have moderate disease. So there we're definitely looking at some hypoxia. We're looking at some lung involvement on imaging, but less than 50% or so, and definitely labored breathing. And then the final 5% or so of patients end up with really severe disease. These are patients that are hospitalized, who are on supplemental oxygen, possibly intubated, often dealing with multi-organ issues, and our fatalities are coming from this 
severe category. So again, thinking about the lung pathology that's seen in severe COVID-19 cases, this is definitely biased because looking in people, we're only seeing lung tissue from autopsy cases. So these are people who had the most severe disease. They did not survive. So on the left here in this panel, we're looking at epithelial cell effects. So we have some hyperplasia here. We have a lot of inflammatory cells coming in, uh, evidence of diffuse alveolar damage, and what looks like some organizing phase DAD. And down here in C, I want to point out uh, these slightly glossier, dark pinker areas. These are the hyaline membranes, and they really wall off the alveolar walls to protect the lung tissue, but as a consequence, they also stop gas exchange. And so these patients are having an incredibly difficult time breathing uh, and getting oxygen in. Over in the vascular section here, I really want to point out in E where these arrows are looking, this is Marty scarlet blue staining looking for fibrin deposition in the lungs. And so this is indicative of microthrombi. And we've seen a lot of issues with thromboses, uh, coagulopathies in COVID-19 patients. And this is pretty novel for COVID-19. Looking back in the literature, there was some evidence of coagulopathies in SARS patients in 2003, but there was a very limited number of cases there. And so just not so much opportunity uh, to be able to identify these rare issues. Uh, and then I mentioned before that lung disease can develop into a fibrosis. We see a lot of evidence of this in some of the autopsy patients where we have all of this connective tissue that really doesn't belong and a lot of inflammation. Uh, we see fluid remnants out in what should be clear alveolar spaces. We see a lot of destruction of alveolar walls. There's really not much structure here. Uh, a lot of thickening of the interstitial membranes and a lot of accumulation of uh, dark purple dots there, which are our inflammatory cells. So our lymphocytes, our monocytes, our neutrophils all coming in, which don't belong in a healthy lung. So I mentioned that COVID-19 and SARS-2 have been associated with a lot of novel coagulopathies that have become one of the hallmarks of severe disease. And so Extremely elevated D-dimer levels have been measured in a lot of severe cases, and this has become a measure that uh, clinicians will use to predict who's going to have a, a worse outcome. We also see reports of clots in 20 to 30 percent of critically ill patients. So some of these are patients who go on to survive, and some of this has been discovered in autopsy analysis. I also see patients with pulmonary embolisms not something that uh, doctors were expecting. Patients are having pretty severe strokes when they're both young as well as in the older population that we usually think of as being at risk for this. And even patients who are sent home who are considered recovered will sometimes end up with abnormal clotting events that can really uh, set back their recovery or are sometimes lethal. And because of all of this, the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis has issued guidelines on anticoagulant use for recovered COVID-19 patients. Uh, this is giving heparin, other drugs, to try and prevent these coagulopathies. However, they're uh, not always following the, the same uh, signaling pathways that would be predicted. And so plasminogen levels, fibrinogen levels, uh, they don't match our typical expectation of what a clotting disorder is. And so there's a lot of research being done in this area. And I want to highlight here uh, from, again, some autopsy cases. So these are particularly clear what these thrombotic events sometimes look like. So here we have uh, grossly obvious events in the heart and in the lung of autopsy patients. And then down here on the bottom, we have uh, massive clotting events in the spleen, the liver, other organs. So this is really seen throughout uh, the body in patients who develop severe disease. Other complications have been observed in tissues that people weren't expecting initially. Our background with coronavirus infection was from those four mild human coronaviruses that just cause a typical upper respiratory infection, common cold. In SARS and MERS, which both had limited numbers of cases, 
However, with tens of millions of people having been infected with SARS-CoV-2, we're able to observe a lot of other complications. And some of these have been in cardiac uh, and kidney presentations. So here we have some slides from the kidney on autopsy showing that uh, we have collapsing glomerules here. We have a lot of antibody that's being deposited in the kidney that shouldn't normally be there. There can be a lot of inflammation that develops in the kidney. And there are a lot of reports of COVID-19 patients requiring dialysis, either pretty suddenly or gradually over time. This can also be complicated uh, because of the clotting issues that we were just talking about, where someone goes on dialysis and then their blood is actually clotting in the tubing and causing major issues. So COVID-19 has really turned into a systemic disease in a lot of patients that's making treatment much, much more complicated. Patients are also presenting with a lot of cardiac issues, and this is turning into kind of a long-term consequence with heart damage in some patients, including in younger patients. So about 10% of hospitalized patients have elevated troponins, which indicate that there's heart damage happening somewhere. Also seeing myocarditis, or inflammation of the heart muscles observed in a large number of COVID-19 patients during their acute disease. And then taking the days and weeks and months after recovery, this can really linger in some patients. There have been notable uh, media reports about myocarditis in American college football players. So we're thinking a pretty young, healthy, active population, you know, 18 to 22 year old males who are playing collegiate sports and suddenly have myocarditis. This can also present a little bit differently than normal. So usually in my myocarditis, we're thinking about a lot of lymphocytes infiltrating the cardiac tissue. We definitely see that, uh, particularly in this slide. However, there are also a lot of macrophages that are being found in the cardiac tissue, which is a little bit of a surprise uh, to doctors. And so again, a new disease, novel presentations, not just uh, respiratory issues. And then kind of the, the final novel manifestation of COVID-19 that I want to talk about is children. I mentioned that typically they experience very mild or asymptomatic SARS-2 infection. However, a su very small subset of children go on to develop multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C, which is an incredibly serious condition that develops uh, in kids who have gone on to recover from infection. It's usually in the weeks or months following where suddenly these recovered kids develop a fever, a rash, some fatigue, maybe red cracked lips, red eyes, some swelling. The presentation can definitely vary a lot, uh, but this is indicative of the start of a massive inflammatory process that can take out critical organs. It's somewhat similar to Kawasaki disease, but presents in older children as well as just really young children. And so this is something that's very worrisome to parents of infected kids and something that, again, we don't fully understand yet because it's in a small number of patients and it's a pretty new uh, disease presentation. So luckily, most of these kids do go on to recover. They can be treated with steroids and other anti-inflammatories, but it depends on getting children to a doctor in a hospital quickly and being aggressive with intervention. So we've talked about all of the different disease presentations and how widely varied they can be. And that raises a lot of questions about what determines disease outcome. It's incredibly complicated. There are a lot of factors that go into this, including host genotype, status of their immune response. Some of that's due to age, whether or not we're dealing with immune senescence. Some of it's considering previous exposure history, uh, general health, there's virus dose, there's virus genotype, which so far with COVID-19 has been remarkably uniform, but it's something people are always looking for with sequencing. Do we have novel mutations coming up that are more pathogenic? So some genome-wide uh, susceptibility studies have been performed where uh, doctors in Italy and Spain enrolled pretty large cohorts of patients very early in the epidemic in these countries and then worked with other clinicians uh, throughout Europe to do all of the analysis. 
and they looked at the association of specific mutations identified by SNP arrays or single nucleotide polymorphisms. They had about 800,000 that they assessed. And they looked at the association of genotype at all of these markers with severity of disease. And they were particularly interested in respiratory failure, looking at patients who required oxygen supplementation and who required mechanical ventilation compared to the regular population. And they found a one highly significant QTL here on chromosome three and a QTL on chromosome nine that almost but not quite made significance. And they still discuss this because it's the ABO blood group locus and blood type has come up as a possible risk factor before. But what I want to talk to you about right now is the chromosome 3 locus that had uh, multiple genes in question here. Uh, some of them are interesting because they're part of the immune response. Some of them interact with ACE2, uh, which we know is the receptor. And so you can come up with a pretty easy hypothesis about how this might be important. It's interesting to note that none of these genes have a coding mutation. So all of the SNPs that are part of this locus that was identified are in non-coding regions. So in the introns, uh, not in the exons of the genome. And our group is examining uh, mouse genes that are in this locus. And we have some exciting data. And I know a lot of other people are looking at uh, human data sets, looking at expression differences. What could be the cause of these mutations and how might they impact disease? We also know that infection dose probably matters, but that's incredibly difficult to determine in people. A lot of us think that part of why masks reduce uh, transmission and spread of severe disease could be because even if people get exposed and become infected, that they get infected with a slightly lower dose. Uh, but it Again, you can't really determine that with people because this type of experiment is incredibly unethical. Uh, and also related to dose, we think that the initial site of infection may also matter, whether or not your infection is initially seated in the upper airway or in the lower airway. We're able to do experiments like this in mice in the laboratory. And so our lab has recently developed a mouse adapted form of the virus, uh, wild type SARS-CoV-2. Uh, has a receptor incompatibility with mouse ACE2. It's not able to bind and infect these cells. So with some work in the lab, we were able to overcome this barrier. And then when we infect uh, Balbsi mice, which are a pretty typical laboratory strain, we infect them with either 10 to the fifth PFU, 10 to the fourth PFU, 10 to the third, or 100 PFU. You can see that the mice that got the highest dose also come to infection, uh, 10 to the fourth, have an intermediate phenotype where some of them recover and some of them succumb. 10 to the third, these mice are recovering earlier and mice that only get 100 plaque forming units of virus have really mild disease and no detectable weight loss. So this is the type of thing where small animal models or laboratory systems really let us address the details that we can't in people. We mentioned before that there are a lot of known risk factors. Some of these deal with general health status. That's more in your obesity, are people smokers? What's alcohol intake like? Uh, are people normally pretty physically active or inactive? And this is all from the World Health Organization website. And then some of these mentioned over here on the left also have immune system involvement. So diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, cancer, especially if someone's being treated with uh, immune inhibitors for cancer diagnosis. These people are pretty immune compromised, have an altered immune response, and this can these can all be pretty big risk factors for developing severe disease. And in the next talk, Carolyn will talk, be talking about uh, pregnancy and how that can play into COVID-19 disease. So all of these factors go into what the outcome of someone's infection is. And the one that I haven't really talked about yet, but Matt got into is the host immune response. We know that coronaviruses are incredibly efficient at evading early detection by the host immune response. They have all of these interferon antagonists. 
uh, different non-structural proteins, or six, which Matt mentioned. And the early host response, this innate immune response, we want it to be active quickly and recognizing the virus so that it can tamp down replication uh, and let the, the host go on to recover. So we want an early strong innate immune response and that allows for a regulated adaptive immune response to come in, uh, clear out the last of the virus, work on tissue regeneration, uh, wound repair, whatever needs to happen to uh, recover at the site of infection. However, since coronaviruses are so good at evading the early immune response, what we see in some patients is that uh, they don't develop an immune response early enough and then the virus replication gets really out of control. When the immune system does kick in, it is too late, you have too much disease, and that's when uh, those checks and balances that are a critical part of the immune response don't do their job, and you end up with really persistent long-term uh, interferon levels. We see severe COVID-19 patients have really high TNF-alpha, IL-6 levels. These are uh, important players in the innate immune response, and they're important for recruiting inflammatory cells to come in to clear infection. However, they can also be associated with vascular leakage and a poor response if they're not controlled in a timely manner. And most recently, the concept of reinfection has been getting a lot of attention. Uh, so just a few days ago, there have been reports in Lancet and other journals about patients who are clearly reinfected where we have uh, genotype information from the first infection, from the second infection, and we can see that these are different, that they've been separated by a number of months, and that for some reason, a small subset of patients are able to become reinfected. So a lot of work has been done looking at the antibody response to infection, both in the context of uh, vaccine trials, looking at antibodies in COVID-19 survivors to see if they can participate in convalescent uh, therapy, uh, serum donations. And so we know that most people do develop an antibody response that includes neutralizing antibodies and that lasts for a number of months. However, this isn't universal. Uh, unfortunately, with the reinfection patients that have recently been discovered, a lot of the times, we don't know their antibody status after the first infection. And we don't always know a lot about their general health due to various uh, patient privacy uh, details in other countries or just uh, inability to follow up with these patients. So as we've mentioned before, with tens of millions of cases happening globally and you know, hundreds of thousands of more cases each day, we are definitely able to see a lot more unusual situations than have previously occurred in coronavirus infection. A lot of researchers are looking into this. We hope that uh, it's not going to be a big thing, that immunity will be, generally speaking, much more lasting. Uh, and especially vaccine companies, the FDA, uh, lots of groups are looking into this and considering what kind of dosing regimens uh, and surveillance might be needed if we can't consider uh, someone who had COVID-19 in March, uh, perhaps to be immune in September or October, then we really need to start rethinking uh, general safety practices, how people are interacting with their community and risk tolerance for exposure. And that brings us finally to COVID-19 long haulers. So these are patients who clear virus, but have lingering long-term symptoms. Most commonly, we're looking at fatigue, lack of energy, shortness of breath. A lot of people have reported brain fog and other neurologic complications. Actually, a pretty high percentage of COVID-19 patients are reporting neurologic uh, issues during their acute infection as well. Uh, so the COVID-19 symptom study has reported that 10% of respondents have symptoms lasting for longer than 30 days, and one and a half to 2% of respondents have symptoms lasting for 90 days. Now we have to assume that because this is an, an app-based reporting method, that 
we're looking at a slight undercount due to people having fatigue with logging their symptoms on a daily basis, especially people who are having ongoing health issues. Now, it seems like these long haulers are having issues with long lasting systemic inflammation or autonomous nervous system dysregulation. A lot of doctors are getting involved in this, seeing patients, trying to figure out, um, you know, the best method for them to lead their lives going forward, hoping for continued recovery, but trying to feel out what day-to-day capabilities are, uh, how much patients can push themselves without spiraling into fatigue and lack of energy situations. It seems somewhat similar to chronic fatigue syndrome or POTS, but getting a lot more attention right now because there's, again, so many COVID-19 patients that the numbers of people who have lingering symptoms are really too high to ignore. And so hopefully these patients will be able to get uh, the help that they need. And we actually did see something like this with uh, SARS survivors. So as Matt said, there were only about 8,000 SARS cases, similar initial symptom presentation, uh, fever, respiratory issues, Uh, pneumonia, muscle aches, all of that, survivors often ended up with uh, lingering pulmonary fibrosis, as well as some femoral necrosis, and this is somewhat due to uh, steroid treatment. And importantly, there are still patients dealing with side effects from SARS 15, 18 years on. So in the uh, 15-year follow-up of a group of patients from Hong Kong, I think two to 4% of them were still dealing with lingering respiratory issues, which, you know, in that subset isn't too many people, but if you think about two to 4% of, you know, we're approaching 40 million cases globally, that's a massive number of people who have long-term health effects from infection. So when we think about these survivors and also future emerging coronaviruses, it's incredibly important to think about what we can do to identify viruses that are likely to emerge in the future, and also how we can treat people who've been infected. And, you know, so far we have SARS and MERS and SARS-2, which all cause pretty similar disease. So it would be great if we could have broad spectrum antivirals, uh, medicines on the shelf that are likely to work for a future emerging coronavirus and not need to come up with a new drug for each new virus. And so, as Matt mentioned, we work with these viruses at biosafety level three in the U.S. And so if we think about biosafety level two, that's researchers wearing lab coats, gloves, working at a hood. Biosafety level three, again, we're wearing a respirator of some variety, which is strapped onto the back, a lot of Tyvek gear, double gloves, a full hood. So we're breathing filtered air. Uh, We're working in specialized facilities that are secured, that have negative air pressure, that undergo a lot of checks. And researchers working in the laboratory undergo background checks, have extensive health monitoring. We have travel restrictions, unfortunately, at the University of North Carolina uh, because our EHS is pretty conservative. But we take this work very, very seriously. And suddenly we have the opportunity to kind of real time help with this pandemic situation. And so, Pharmaceuticals that we've worked with directly at UNC have included remdesivir, which has early youth authorization in the U.S., EIDD 2801, which has a new fancy name now that it's being put into people, is also um, in phase three clinical trials. So these are direct anti-acting antivirals that target the NSP12 RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that is essential for virus replication. Uh, We're also doing a lot of monoclonal antibody testing. So Regeneron has just made the news uh, because President Trump got some of their antibodies uh, when he was recently ill. They're in clinical trials currently, but sometimes available under compassionate use. Eli Lilly has monoclonal antibodies in clinical trial as well, but their trial just paused because of an unexpected health event. These monoclonal antibody therapies are pretty expensive to develop in mass quantities. So I think Regeneron said that they have about 50,000 doses that will be available, but we have more than 50,000 cases occurring each day in the U.S. And the manufacturing process is pretty expensive and slow. And we have also obviously a lot of companies that are well into phase three vaccine trials. A couple of them have been paused, but others are ongoing. 
So we have a lot of uh, things in the works, but we don't have a magic bullet at this point. So to summarize what I've shown you today, we have tens of millions of COVID-19 patients uh, globally. And while initially we thought of COVID-19 as strictly a respiratory disease, we now know that many patients develop systemic disease, have issues with other organs, and we're still developing new manifestations and learning a lot about how this disease presents itself and what we can do to uh, treat patients going forward. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and uh, just briefly mention the group at UNC who were involved in the bit of mouse work that I told you about. So thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate that. Uh, and I wanna remind everybody that uh, following our third speaker, uh, Carolyn Coyne, uh, there is going to be a 45 minute uh, panel with uh, the speakers and myself, and we'll be able to address uh, questions uh, about the uh, what has uh, been talked about and um, uh, any other uh, issues that arise. So uh, lastly, I'd like to introduce our uh, third speaker, especially appropriate for this uh, particular group, uh, Carolyn Coyne. Uh, Carolyn Coyne um, is at the University of Pittsburgh uh, Medical Center. She is a professor and director of the Center of Microbial Pathogenesis. Um, she's actually also has uh, appointments in four different departments, the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics, Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences, Department of Pediatrics, and the Department of uh, Immunology. Um, she was a graduate uh, student at the University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where she received her uh, PhD uh, and was a, uh, had a research fellowship uh, as a postdoc in uh, microbiology at the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, her interest is in the um, uh, aspects of virology, immunology, and cell biology uh, dissecting aspects of virus host interactions with a particular focus on polarized cell types, uh, and in particular in the placental barrier or the gastrointestinal barrier. And I have to say that uh, Carolyn really has made uh, pioneering uh, discoveries in the mechanism by which uh, the placenta, uh, placenta provides a barrier between virus infection or microbial infection uh, in the mother and transmission to the fetus. And she'll uh, give us some fundamental insights into that process today. Carolyn. Thank you very much, Rich. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here in whatever time zone you're at, morning, afternoon, or night, I think we span everywhere. Um, so as Rich said, my lab has had a really long-standing interest in basic placental innate immunity. And really what I think we're very interested in understanding is how viruses um, that are associated with fetal disease bypass the placental barrier. And then sort of a, a counterpoint to that is how the placenta has evolved to be um, such, a, I would say, a, a powerful barrier to infectious diseases and infection. And so really my talk is gonna be largely background on the structure of the human placenta, because I think that's really key to understanding you know, how and why the human placenta is such a, a formidable barrier to infections. Um, and then I'll end with a little bit more um, that's about then how viruses that are associated with teratogenic um, uh, malformations could potentially bypass that barrier. Um, but what I want to do is, is just keep, you know, uh, keep in mind throughout this talk that, you know, in the context of pregnancy, I think infections really represent a unique, uh, a unique sort of push and pull. And that, of course, there needs to be protection from infection, um, from the maternal, uh, from the maternal immune system, also from the fetal derived placenta and the, and the fetal immune system. But this, of course, can't come at the expense of things such as a loss of tolerance, which means that the mother rejects the developing fetus in pregnancy, or things such as chronic inflammation which can lead to preterm birth or fetal loss. And so I think understanding this push and pull that exists in pregnancy, particularly as it relates to immunology and infectious diseases, is I think really critical to understanding um, all kinds of different um, infections in pregnancy. 
So what I'm actually going to do is spend a, a fair amount of time, probably, um, you know, at least a quarter, if not half of the talk, going over the, the specifics and a general introduction of the human placenta, um, both the cell types that comprise the placenta, but also then starting to kind of think about how the placenta has evolved to be a barrier. And so there are certainly physical barriers of the placenta. We now know there are chemical barriers of the placenta to viral infections. And so I'll just sort of review some of those for you. But first, I'll start for those of you that may not be familiar with the placenta as an organ or as a, as a tissue, I'll start with a fairly fundamental background. And so the first thing that I want to point out is that the placenta is actually a fetal derived organ that of course lies at the maternal fetal interface. I think one of the most common misconceptions about the placenta is that it's a maternal tissue or organ when in fact it's actually derived from the fetus and so therefore is genetically matched to the fetus. If you look at here at one of the earliest sort of um, uh, images that was taken in the mid 60s of a first trimester um, a developing fetus and a placenta, you can sort of begin to then appreciate the, the size of the placenta relative to the developing, uh, to the developing fetus. Um, of course, the placenta exists as a barrier and conduit between the maternal and fetal um, blood. There is no direct mixing of maternal and fetal blood in pregnancy. And so the placenta, of course, then has to mediate all of the gas, nutrient, and waste exchange from the fetal blood to the maternal blood and vice versa. The placenta is comprised of, of really specialized cells known as trophoblasts, and I'll go into a little bit more introduction about what these cells are and what makes them unique. And so therefore, when we're thinking about infections in pregnancy, you have to keep in mind that because the fetal derived placenta is in direct contact with maternal blood, any infectious agents that are circulating systemically in the maternal circulation will then come into direct contact with that placental or therefore fetal surface. And so this is just more of a schematic representation of what the human placenta looks like. I'm just going to note that, that not all placentas are created equally, and the human placenta is actually quite distinct from the placentas of other eutherian organisms, including various rodent-based models. And so today I'm really going to focus on the human placenta. If you're interested in that, there's various review articles that I can point you in the direction of that, that really discuss the different evolution of, of the different placental structures. So this is just a cross-section of the human placenta, which is called a hemochorial placenta. All that means is that the maternal blood, the heme, is in direct contact with the chorion or the placenta. And so what you can look at here is that there's this, this um, zoomed up schematic includes both the maternal and the fetal sides of this kind of interface. On the maternal side is the decidua. So this is the unique uh, mucus-like uh, membrane layers that form in the context of pregnancy in the uterine wall. If we move down into the placenta side, the human placenta is formed of these sort of finger-like projections that are called chorionic villi. And so these villi, as you can see here in this schematic, are bathed in maternal blood. This transition actually occurs at the end of the first trimester. So in the first trimester of human pregnancy, there's actually no direct contact of maternal blood with the fetal-derived placenta. And so a little bit later when we're talking about you know, mechanisms of vertical transmission, Something to keep in mind is certainly that the human placenta is quite different and distinct at different stages of gestation. It evolves and it changes. And that, of course, will have an influence on the potential of various viruses or infectious agents to cross that placenta. And again, these are these chorionic villi that are composed of these trophoblast cells that I mentioned. And so we're just going to zoom up on one of these chorionic villi structures. And I'm going to point out to you that there are three different kinds of trophoblasts that exist in the placenta. And again, this is going to um, really be relevant when thinking about microbial vertical transmission and how different viruses or, or other uh, microorganisms could target the placenta to bypass it. And so starting at the maternal side, so in this case now we have the maternal decidua, in green are what are called extravillous trophoblasts. So these cells are highly invasive migratory cells. They almost resemble cancer-like cells and that these cells will migrate uh, from the tips of these chorionic villi, so this is the fetal placenta down here, just represented a little bit differently, and physically anchor the fetal placenta into the maternal decidua. And these cells also are the cells that remodel the maternal microvasculature to deliver the, the maternal blood. If we go down into the chorionic villi, there are two kinds of trophoblast cells. This inner sort of continuous layer of mononuclear cells in this sort of light purple uh, color form the sort of inner layer of the human placenta. These can really be thought of as I would say progenitor cells and that they have the capacity to differentiate either into these extravillous trophoblasts or into these this darker kind of layer of cells covered the surface of the human placenta, which are called syncytiotrophoblasts. Syncytiotrophoblasts are highly unique. They're probably, I would say, unlike any other human, uh, any other cell in human biology. 
These cells are actually a fused monolayer of cells, and they're actually formed by the fusion of these kind of inner layer purple cytotrophoblasts, actually through the function of an endogenous retrovirus fusion protein, which then leads to the formation of this outer syncytiotrophoblast layer. And so what makes these cells then very unique, of course, is that these cells don't have junctions between them. There's no sort of touching between the cells. This is a contiguous monolayer that forms the entire surface of the placenta. It's been stated that if in a, a full-term placenta, you were to remove this entire monolayer, it would basically cover the surface of a parking spot. Because again, the placenta has to have a very large surface area to sort of mediate all of the gas, nutrient, and waste exchange. I always like to show this picture again, just as we sort of now transition into the more second half of the talk. Again, just to sort of, I, I think, point out to you then how uh, the syncytiotrophoblast layer really has to be the primary barrier of the human placenta. And so what you're just looking at here is what's called the differential interference contrast image of one of these chorionic villi from a 16-week fetus. And over here is just sort of a matched um, confocal micrograph showing you the sort of outer syncytiotrophoblast layer. But if you focus over here on the, the DIC image, I just want to point out to you that the sort of dark stuff that's in the middle of the chorionic villi, well, that's a fetal microvasculature. And the sort of lighter kind of thin layer of cells is actually the syncytiotrophoblast with the maternal blood that would be out here. And so I think when you see this image, you then begin to appreciate then how these syncytiotrophoblasts have to have evolved to be such a, a powerful barrier to viral and other microbial vertical transmission. Because again, anything that's present in maternal blood could then interact with the syncytiotrophoblast layer. And it really is this layer that's keeping out these infectious agents from within this inner, this inner core. And so I just want to point out here to pause when thinking about, you know, how is the placenta such a barrier to infectious diseases? You know, how can we have millions of, let's say, COVID-19 positive um, infections, certainly a, a, a much lower, but uh, population of those, of course, would occur in pregnant women. And at least it would appear that in many of those cases, the fetus remains unharmed. And so what are the barriers that exist in the human placenta? And the first is, is what I would refer to as, I would say, one of the, the, the most powerful physical barriers. And that is the barrier I mentioned before. Four, which is that this outer syncytiotrophoblast layer, so what we're looking at here is just a chorionic villi. In this case, we're doing immunostaining for a, a junction marker, so again, the kind of kissing point between cells. And again, if you just look over here, this again points out to you that this is a contiguous layer, monolayer of cells. There are no junctions between these cells. Certainly, we know for viruses and you know, other microorganisms that often junctions can be weakened as a mechanism for how these different uh, agents could cross the the, the um, epithelial barriers. And so one of the very, I would say, most powerful barriers of the placenta is this physical barrier in that there are no junctions between these cells. It's a continuous monolayer. And so therefore there's no infections, no inflammation is really gonna disrupt the barrier function. Okay, so the other thing I just wanna kind of, you know, I, I would say in the context of, of what we're thinking about in terms of either COVID-19 or other infections, infections in pregnancy is that pregnancy itself, particularly at the maternal fetal interface, I would say really represents a unique immunological crosstalk that doesn't generally exist in other any other context of biology. And the reason I say that is certainly what we know is that the placenta secretes many, many different molecules during pregnancy. Of course, the placenta is the primary producer of many of the hormones that are required to, to, to maintain a successful pregnancy. But we also know from our work and others is that the placenta also will constitute constitutively release many different uh, molecules that then alter either the fetal slash placental immunological landscape or that of the mother. But we also have to keep in mind that the mother's the mother is also then providing her own signals, which can come from the decidua. You know, one of the things I will point out is that the decidua is composed of at least 40% immune cells. And what we know is that the maternal decidua also then provides signals at this interface. And so what's unique about pregnancy then is how this kind of unique crosstalk occurs at the maternal fetal interface, where you would certainly have different signals from the fetal side interacting with the maternal side, which then could impact various aspects of infection. And that's really what we've been most interested in understanding. Again, is how is this how is this immunological crosstalk then influenced by a family of what are called torch infections? So torch pathogens designate um, various microorganisms or microorganisms with known teratogenic effects. And so torch just stands for Toxoplasma gondii, a parasite. 
other, which is kind of the dumping ground for many different infectious uh, agents. And so Listeria monocytogenes, VZV, HIV, Zika virus is in this category, as well as rubella virus, cytomegalovirus, and herpes viruses. And so what we know is in the context of infections, then this crosstalk is going to be different. This also, of course, then would play a role during COVID-19, where we certainly now know that the maternal immune response will initiate a robust immune, uh, immune response to infection, which again could then influence how this crosstalk is occurring. So now what I'm gonna do is just move a little bit from those physical barriers that I was talking about before and to what I like to refer to as the more chemical barriers of the, of the human placenta. And how does the human placenta then use these, bar these sort of different agents to protect itself from infection? So what I'm just showing you here is a, a, an overview of a, probably about 10 years of work that, that's been done in my lab, that's done by a graduate student, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Delorme Axford, and two different po uh, previous postdocs and, and graduate students in my lab. And so what my lab likes to do is to use as much as possible human primary based systems. And so we use two of them that I'll just highlight here. One are primary human trophoblasts or PHT cells that we can isolate from either full-term placentas or mid-gestation placentas. Um, these cells really have the unique capacity that they fuse in culture. And so these sort of large multinucleated cells represent that syncytio trophoblast layer. But as much as possible, we like to complement our studies using uh, mid-gestation or first trimester when possible human placental explants. So again, what we can do is collect a placenta and we can dissect out those chorionic villi such that we can maintain the architecture of the placenta where again, you'd have that fetal blood supply as well as the different cell types that exist in the placenta. And so what we've done, and again, I'm summarizing lots of work that if you're interested, I just include the citations for is, is what I think became very clear as a virologist who started studying this many years ago is that primary placental cells and placenta tissue are highly resistant to diverse viruses. We've tested a whole panel of viruses, different teratogenic viruses I've listed here, CMV, herpes viruses, Zika, and they potently resist infection. Second to that though, is they release different molecules that work in paracrine, so on other cells, non-placental cells, to then imp uh, impart protection from those cells as well. And again, we've tested a variety of different viruses here. We've not yet tested SARS-2, but I will tell you, I don't expect these data to be any different, um, which I'm happy to talk about why that might be. But I'm just listing sort of a, a sampling of viruses that we've tested. One thing that I'll point out to you for any of you that are interested in the basic science of this or wanting to get into this as, as, as modeling for coronaviruses or others is that none of these phenotypes are actually retained in cell line models. And so although there are a number of different cell line models of the placenta, the trophoblast that you can purchase, let's say, from a variety of different vendors, such as the, the ATCC here in the US, none of these phenotypes are retained. And so that in and of itself kind of tells you there's something very unique about the human placenta, particularly these syncytiotrophoblasts blast these fused cells. And so one thing that I want to point out to you is in, a different, in addition to all of the work that we've done just in our lab using various models of the placenta is that the syncytio trophoblasts seem to really potently resist infection in vivo as well. And this can be seen in a variety of different congenital cases of pregnancy. So what you're looking at over here was just a, a, a maternal infection that occurred at 10 weeks with a fetal loss at 27 weeks. This occurred in Brazil during the Zika virus outbreak. And now what you're looking at is just a cross section of one of those chorionic villi that's been actually um, stained for Zika virus viral RNA, which is this sort of purple. So what I want to highlight out for you here in yellow is that's the syncytiotrophoblast. So despite the fact that there are robust uh, levels of replication that are occurring sort of within these chorionic villi, so again, that would represent the fetal blood supply, that would represent fetal cells, indicating that the virus has indeed passed the placental barrier. You'll appreciate here that the syncytiotrophoblast layer is very, uh, is very spared from infection. This can also be seen in, in in the context of other congenital infections. And so this is a sort of similar staining. I'm now looking for a, C a cytome human cytomegalovirus protein, again, in a, in a placenta from a case of congenital CMV in a full-term placenta, where again, I'm just highlighting for you here in yellow, that sort of outer syncytiotrophoblast layer. And what you can see in both CMV as well as Zika virus is that there are very discrete subpopulations of cells within the core um, that seem to be permissive to infection. And those cells are actually referred to as Hoff virus cells. They're a fetal derived macrophage or an M2 macrophage that resides within the core of the human placenta. And so I wanna point this out to you because in the context of both Zika virus as well as CMV, infection within this villus core indicates that the virus has in fact bypassed the placental barrier and is likely then in impacting infection within the fetus itself.
What I want to do is contrast this just with, with SARS-CoV-2. And, and certainly from at least my perspective, there is no evidence so far that SARS-CoV-2 itself is a torch pathogen. Certainly what we know is that there can be pregnancy complications of, of infection with, with SARS-2 um, in pregnant women. And, and again, I'll touch on the end of this talk how that could be happening. But what I want to point out to you is just work that was recently published um, that, again, what, what the um, group was looking for was COVID-19 positive women who delivered who delivered their infants. And so what they found is in a single placenta of 15 total women who are COVID-19 positive, that they can actually uh, perform immunohistochemistry for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein that, that Matt had talked about. But I want to point out to you that something that's really critical to understand is that all of this staining here is in that outer syncytiotrophoblast layer. And I want you to counter this to what I showed you before, which is Zika virus infecting the core. So in fact, what these IHC data would suggest is that SARS-CoV-2 has actually not bypass the placental barrier, that for reasons that are unclear, there seems to be some um, sort of concentration of the spike protein within the syncytiotrophoblast layer. But I hope you can kind of appreciate then that that spike protein has not bypassed that barrier. And so what that means is that the syncytiotrophoblast is keeping whatever is, 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 is associated with the spike protein out of the fetal circulation. And so what we've been interested then is understanding what are the placental factors that then, you know, impact this, this maternal uh, fetal susceptibility to viral infections. And again, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes highlighting some of the work that we have done to, to, to look at that. And Matt, uh, uh, in, his, in his talk earlier, introduced this concept of interferons. And so I won't spend a great deal of time on that. But just to highlight that, you know, whereas Matt, as well as Lisa, talked a lot about these type 1 interferons that you may be familiar with. And so these are interferon alphas, interferon beta, which, of course, are generally induced when a, when a cell detects the presence of a foreign nucleic acid such, such that exists in the context of a viral infection, signaling through this IFNAR receptor complex, and then leading to the induction of hundreds of different interferon-stimulated genes. And although interferons are certainly referred to as the most potent, at least biological, antiviral agents, and they are, interferons themselves don't possess any antiviral activity. It's actually these hundreds of ISGs that get induced that possess the antiviral activity. But what you may be less familiar with actually are type three interferons. So type three interferons are the interferon lambdas. And these have really emerged um, to, to be um, interferons that are associated with, with uh, viral responses more at barrier surfaces. And so we see this in the respiratory barrier barrier. Others have shown that, that this actually occurs with SARS-CoV-2. Certainly in the gastrointestinal tract, we see this. This is the interferon lambdas. They actually signal through a different receptor complex. Again, but the downstream signaling is quite the same. And so, you know, why have multiple interferons? And so, of course, type 1 interferons, if NAR is broadly expressed, most nu nucleated cells can respond to interferons. And so you would then induce a very broad systemic antiviral immune response. Whereas type 3 interferons, in contrast to if NAR, the type 3 interferon receptor complex is highly restricted in, in its expression. So in addition to type 3 interferons being preferentially made by these barrier cell types, the receptor also seems to be restricted in its expression as well. And so why have multiple interferons? And so what I'll do is just sort of at least tell you what, what I envision this looking like, which is the difference between controlling infection systemically or locally. So in the context of a, of a type 1 interferon response, I'll just use a gastrointestinal tract infection as sort of a model. You could then imagine that if you had a viral infection and type 1 interferons were made, these interferons might reach the systemic circulation. As I mentioned, most cells, all cells express IFNAR. Then you would sort of feed forward, uh, amplify this signal to lead to a really systemic pro-inflammatory response to this infection. In contrast, type 3 interferons are produced locally, and so again, they would be produced at the site of infection, let's say in the gastrointestinal tract. Many of the cell types that respond to type 3 interferons would also be restricted. And so by contrast, what you then have is a more localized uh, uh, inflammatory response. And so what this really comes down to is damage control, basically distinguishing between a systemic pro-inflammatory versus a localized uh, uh, antiviral response. And so what we, ha we have found is actually quite surprising which is that the human placenta constitutively makes type three interferons. So I won't show you the data, but the placenta does not make type one interferons. So again, alpha or beta. But what we now can appreciate is that in both full term and mid gestation trophoblasts, they constitutively make type three interferons. This is just looking in, in mid gestation villi. These are the primary human trophoblasts. This is just a, a, one of the choriocarcinoma cell lines I mentioned before that doesn't seem to resist viral infections. 
So again, similar to that or in, in consistent with this is that these chorionic villi as well as the primary cells basally express very high levels of these very, very antiviral interferon stimulated genes. This is just a heat map from, from some RNA-seq profiling that we did a number of years ago. But what this basically means is that these trophoblasts essentially have a firing squad such that if a virus bypasses or it makes its way into the syncytial trophoblast layer, there are hundreds of these ISGs that are very, very highly expressed that are waiting to basically um, suppress the infection. Which again, if you remember sort of that IHC image I showed you of SARS-CoV-2 of the spike protein, it certainly would suggest that that might be happening, that the virus may very well enter into that syncytial trophoblast layer, but these cells again are kind of primed to respond to infection. So I'm not going to show you all the data that, that we've done to sort of support this model, but what we think is that type 3 interferons, again, are constitutively made from the human placenta. We know that they act in autocrine to protect the placenta itself from infection. We also know that they work in paracrine to protect maternal derived cells, let's say such as the decidua and various other cells within the on the maternal side from infection as well. We've used a variety of different sort of biological tools to suppress the signaling. And what we've shown is that if you inhibit this more autocrine loop, you can sensitize the human placenta to infection. In this case, we've used Zika virus as a model, and then you can do the exact same on the maternal side. So what I'll just do is end with, with some unpublished data and then wrap up with just a model. And that is to say, does interferon lambda protect at all stages of gestation? And so, as I mentioned before, you know, the human placenta undergoes really dramatic changes throughout gestation. And, and certainly one can think about the uh, human pregnancy in, in two to three distinct stages. One is the sort of very earliest stages of pregnancy that happens within about five to seven days uh, post-conception, wherein the, the um, placenta begins to form as this continuous trophectoderm layer that surrounds the fertilized blastocyst. And again, those cells also have to form as a, as a barrier uh, very early in pregnancy. You then have the first trimester in which the human placenta is really undergoing its most significant morphologic and cellular changes. And then you have the later stages of pregnancy, the second and third trimester. And so one thing to keep in mind though, is that in humans, the risk of severe infection induced by a congenital disease um, occurs really much more in the early stages of pregnancy. Certainly in the first trimester is when most teratogenic microorganisms will induce their most pronounced congenital disease. Whereas in the second to third trimester, usually the fetus can be can be spared. And so what I showed you before was largely based upon tissues and cells that were isolated from this later stages of gestation. And we, know, we now know that these type 3 interferons are constitutively made. But what happens in earlier in gestation? And is it possible then that these syncytiotrophoblasts or trophoblasts in, these, in either the various early stages of human pregnancy or perhaps even the first trimester lack these defenses? And might that explain why these teratogenic viruses could bypass the placental barrier? And so certainly modeling the, the human placenta is, is not easy, of which I'm happy to talk about uh, afterwards. But one of the, I would say, most significant changes we've had, at least in terms of what we can model in the lab, is the development of trophoblast organoid models. This was initially described, and I'll, I have the reference down here by Ashley Moffat in, in Cambridge, and I really think has revolutionized our ability to study the very, very earliest stages of the human placenta. And so what we can do is isolate these chorionic villi from placentas. We can isolate out the stem cells, and just like you can with various organoid models. You can grow them in matrigel, which I like to refer to as sort of like a jello-like substance, provide the, the different growth factors, and they will differentiate into this sort of earlier stages of the trifectoderm layer, which again models early in pregnancy. And so these are, and this is just done by Henry Yang, a postdoc in my lab. These are what these organoids will look like. You'll form these very large spherical 3D layers, as well as these, again, highly migratory invasive trophoblasts that kind of grow out from that layer. This is just what these organoids, organoids look like. Um, and again, because they're, they're developed from the human placenta, they secrete all of the placental hormones. This is just looking at HCG through sort of standard over-the-counter um, test strips. These are from different uh, trophoblast organoids. Here's our term primary cells and here is our villi. And this is just showing that these, that these trophoblast organoids constitutively make pregnancy hormones such as human chorionic gonadotropin. And so what we now also know is that these trophoblast organoids also constitutively secrete type three interferons. And so you're just looking at differences in type one or type three interferons, again, constitutively be made by these trophoblast organoids. And we can compare the levels actually being made to again, full term primary cells or mid gestation villi and see that the levels are indistinguishable. And so now we can again, show the same model, but say that excuse me, we think that actually type three interferons play a role in protecting the placenta, likely at many stages of gestation, 
not just in the second and third trimester, but this actually may be a mechanism by which that very early trifectoderm layer could begin to sort of uh, uh, impart some resistance to viral infections to the developing blastocyst. And so, Oh, excuse me. What I'm just going to end with then is, is sort of a more theoretical model of, okay, then how do viruses breach the placental barrier? You know, I've spent the last 24 minutes um, describing the various um, mechanisms by which the human placenta defends from infections. But then why do we have teratogenic viruses? Why do we have CMV and Zika virus? And so what I can tell you is that I don't have a lot of answers for you, but certainly there are themes that emerge in a variety of different um proposed mechanisms for this. One I think is, has certainly emerged as one of the most common strategies used by a variety of different um, viral and non-viral teratogenic um, uh, microorganisms. And that is to directly infect and replicate in these extra villus trophoblasts. Again, those are those migratory cells that are embedded in the maternal decidua. And so if you look at this cartoon here, which is just from a review article from a number of years ago, you can then see that these cells become portals by which uh, an infectious agent could replicate in these cells bypass the defenses of the syncytiotrophoblast layer, again, and reach this inner villus core where they may target the Hofbauer macrophages or other cell types. But there are certainly many other uh, mechanisms that have been proposed. Um, there's breaches in the trophoblast layers. We certainly know that in the context of maternal viral infections, um, that interferon, type one interferon signaling could potentially damage the placental uh, layer. This was a really nice study done by Akiko Iwasaki's lab a number of years ago now, using Zika virus as a mouse model, showing that type one interferons actually damage the syncytiotrophoblast layer, which could then lead to breaches in the, in this, in the barrier and then allow vertical transmission. Again, there's this concept of trafficking or signaling from maternal immune cells. Again, in the context of something like COVID-19, where as Lisa was, was describing, there's this really robust um, pro-inflammatory cytokine response. It's certainly possible that this response could alter the defenses of the placenta and either lead to just damages in the placental function um, without vertical transmission, or could again, in, in sort of enact some amount of, of, of deficiency in the barrier function that would allow for vertical transmission. And so my final slide is just to end with, at least for me, conceptually, um, how I think about what how vertical transmission works for viruses, which is, I always like to think about this as building a roadmap of there are probably many ways in. And so, you know, what are the pathways then by which viruses are vertically transmitted? And so first is I really think that it's unlikely to be a one size fits all. I don't think in the context of every pregnant woman who is infected with a teratogenic virus or, or microorganism, that the path is always the same. I think it could vary between, um, for many different uh, reasons. Um, and so I really think it's unlikely that, that there's a single mechanism per, you know, per microorganism. I think it's likely to vary at different stages of gestation. Um, you know, one of the things that I pointed out was just how much the placenta changes during gestation. And so, you know, a, a, a maternal infection in the early to first trimester could be very, very different than the later stages of pregnancy. It certainly, I think, is probably likely uh, impacted by the maternal response to infection. So as I mentioned, there are a variety of different uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, antiviral cytokines that could very well damage the placental barrier. And so the more robust of a uh, maternal immune response, the barrier function could be damaged or weakened. It certainly could be impacted by things like maternal viremia, and again, it could likely also be impacted by uh, placental derived responses, again, as well as, as maternal responses. And so how that kind of dialogue happens at the maternal fetal interface. And so with that, I'm just going to close and acknowledge the members of my lab that have done a lot of this work. Um, I mentioned before sort of the former members of my lab. I mentioned Henry, who's a postdoc, who's really been, I would say, fantastic in developing um, the organoid model that, that we've been working with in the lab. We've had a, a, been very, very fortunate to have a variety of collaborators, uh, thank our sources of funding, and just mention that although I'm currently at the University of Pittsburgh, I'll actually be re relocating to Duke University um, next spring. And so with that, I will close, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Carolyn. So uh, we now move on to a discussion phase. But first, uh, it looks like uh, Dr. DeCaro is going to be able to uh, stick around. Is that right? Um, yes. So, OK, yeah. excellent. So um, for, uh, for our discussion, we're going to have uh, not only uh, the speakers and myself, uh, but we have uh, joining us from uh, Italy, uh, Dr. Antonino DeCaro. Uh, I want to give you a little background on uh, Dr. DeCaro and um, 
Uh, he's going to give a short presentation that will uh, introduce uh, his expertise and interest in the uh, topic to uh, orient you for the, uh, for the discussion. So uh, Dr. DeCaro did his uh, medical degree at the University of Rome, followed up sequentially by three different specialties uh, degrees, one in uh, hygiene and public health, one in hygiene and hospital management, and one in medical microbiology and uh, virology. Uh, he's currently the uh, director of microbiology and laboratory, uh, uh, director of microbiology, laboratory, and infectious diseases biorepository at the National Institute for Infectious uh, Diseases. Um, uh, and he's an expert on basic and diagnostic virology, including uh, infection of RG3 and four agents, member of the institutional biosafety uh, chemical infection uh, control uh, committee at, um, I'm sorry, Dr. DeCaro, INMI. What's? Uh, it is the national, it is in Italian, Istituto Nazionale Malattie Infettive. Ah, okay, that so the that's the net. Okay, great. Thank you very much. He has extensive experience uh, in uh, on training and activity of viruses involving diagnostic, pathogenic, molecular, and biosafety aspects. His research activities related to biodefense, biosecurity, and biosafety, biobanking, emergency, emerging, and reemerging infections on the establishment and validation of innovative diagnostic methods. He's a principal investigator or participant to the national research programs and to numerous uh, European research projects on emerging and infectious diseases. And he's involved in the WHO, GOARN and EDCARN activities as part of uh, the Institute's uh, team uh, with the task of assessing the World Health Organization uh, as a collaborating center. And he has previous experience with international mission for outbreak response in developing countries in Africa uh, on the development of tools and protocols for diagnosis of viral hemorrhagic fever. So uh, we're uh, pleased to have um, uh, Dr. DeCaro uh, with us and he'll give a short presentation before we move on to um, uh, a, an open discussion, including all the speakers. Dr. Carl, welcome. Okay, I try to share the screen. Just okay. Can you uh, can you see the screen now or not? Uh, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Uh, the screen. Okay. Professor Vicar uh, is Fabio. Now, okay, good. Yeah. Now it should work. Just a moment. Good. If you can put it in presentation okay. mode, then it would be okay. Can you can you look at this now? Uh, yes, that uh, showing up quite well. It's good. Okay. So the idea is, uh, my experience is, I started yes. working. Can you put it in presentation mode? Yes, it is in presentation mode now. Good. OK. Uh, just to say that I started working on basic research. Now I am working mostly in applied research and public health research, but uh, I really appreciated the presentation before because remember me of when I was young. But anyway, I'll try to describe some activity that we are performing here about the genetic, the study of the genetic heterogeneity of SARS-CoV-2 and the application that we can do of studying it. This is a virus in which there's been an unprecedented experience in doing it because uh, we had more than uh, 147,000 uh, sequences that has been deposited in a common database. In particular, this is an ecology site. So uh, molecular biologists have the possibility to study the evolution of the virus. A lot of people are looking at that. 
it is really unknown in the past. And one of the characteristics of this is that we can look and why to study and make genetical evaluation and next generation sequencing or good genome sequencing of this virus. Why to know the full genome? Probably has been described also before because we have to look at the dynamic of the quasi species and we can use the data for epidemiology surveillance, for contact tracing. But in addition, we are interested to evaluate if there are variations of the sequence that can affect the diagnostic test as well as to study viral evolution or us or try to discover some of the mutations that are appearing, even if the virus is mutating very slowly and very few mutations appear because even if it is very big, it has some proofreading system that allow to, to reduce the number of mutations. And we are also studying compartment, compartment Mentalization and drug resistant variants. We have been speaking before about monoclonal antibody response that can be affected by a mutation on the spike protein, especially. And just to show what we have done, this is only some example of it. It is, uh, we investigate about uh, the contact tracing experience. We investigated uh, the outbreaks that were reported in Italy uh, to the travel that, that were returning from Asia. In this case, it is uh, two clade that were reported from Bangladesh. They entered uh, during the summer in the Fiumicino airport and we discovered a lot of infection, about 50 persons out of 400 tested that come from the airplane directly from Dhaka. And so we had most of them clustered. So just to show that this way, we can show the effect of importation of cases in, in in the country and in Italy in particular. Further, we investigated also nosocomial cluster. This is an example of a nosocomial cluster. I tried, it is a still ongoing investigation, so I try to delete any relation or information about the hospital that is involved. And you can see sometimes that we can also reconstruct the story of the patient that have been infected according to the world in which they have been uh, recovered or admitted. Uh, this is the description. The red one are the cardiology. And we have also a case from the medicine and that was affected on the cardiology. And we have the medicine here and so on. Just to show that uh, it can be done and uh, it can be useful to sequence, uh, to, uh, to support the epidemiological investigation of cases. This is something that is uh, just in the middle between uh, public health uh, use of uh, sequencing and research. In this case, uh, we uh, studied the evolution of the virus inside the transmission chain. I just happened to discover that I have not translated the title, but it is just information about a subcluster of familiar transmission. And we study the minority variants. That means that we are doing the sequencing of the whole virus and we use the consensus that is the more frequent sequence that we found, but virus can vary during the evolution inside a human organism. And you can find also variations that are 
only present in part of the virus, so especially in uh, uh, RNA, RNA virus that uh, can uh, mutate a little more. And this is the case in which we had the case that were the 109 that transmits the infection. This is an epidemiological link that has been constructed, uh, the, taking into account of the, uh, the epidemiological information collected. And also the study of, sub, uh, of uh, minority variants just show us that, uh, for example, this mutation that is uh, on a nucleotide 9,800 56 uh, that was uh, a synonymous uh, in which we had uh, a, a G in the wild type and a T in the mutation uh, that was uh, in uh, patient uh, 188. It, uh, this mutation was present in only 11 of the sequences that uh, were studied and after uh, the evolution we have found it in 76 in 100 and in 100, just in the last two cases, so that is 171 to 200. Just to show you the potency of the system and the possibility to study not only in a big number, but also inside the body, the evolution of the virus, just aiming to discover variation that can adapt the virus to the different body compartment or that uh, uh, can become predominant because they are selected during the replication, so allow the virus to replicate better. So just to conclude, because I have the only limited time, I would say that uh, continued the genomic surveillance using next generation sequencing can you be useful to improve monitoring and understanding of the virus, the rapid identification of possible mutations can be relevant and uh, to detect the mutation that can be related to the severity of the spread of the infection, but also the compartmentalization, that means the capability of the virus to affect different distracts of the human body. And uh, to identify signature of attrition of the virus, that can be also useful for, for development of, of vaccine and treatment. And uh, obviously, epidemic cluster identification and uh, to inform uh, the public health uh, decision making. Uh, another thing so that I have not put in the, in the slides uh, that can be useful for, for discussion, it is uh, that uh, we are using this method also to discover the reinfection. It is not so easy. In the published cases, uh, they manage to discover cases that were easy because they were infected by different plague. Plague means that the virus that are very different uh, once by the other. But uh, in an epidemiological situation like our in Italy, but I think also in the United States where the virus that are circulating are mutating very few, uh, it is difficult to discover if uh, you have an, a, a reinfection. You have uh, to discover new rule to establish if uh, there is an infection, at least by the genetic point of view. You have uh, to rely mostly, I think, on clinical data and uh, on uh, the appearance or not uh, of uh, serological response. Over. I'm ready for uh, questions. Okay, so if um, uh, the other speakers could uh, make themselves visible, I think we can go on. Joe, do you want to uh, join us as well? Uh, and we're now uh, entertaining uh, questions. I've accumulated a bunch myself in case there's uh, any absences. I have. Uh, one here that came through on the chat. Um, for Carolyn, according to the placental structure and function that you beautifully explained, how do you consider the risk of SARS-CoV-2 to pass through the barrier? Uh, 
can you comment on the published cases of congenital, uh, congenital infection? Sure, happy to. Um, so, I mean, what I would say in the case, at least from the from the reports that I've seen, is I would say it's the exception rather than the rule. I think the risk is actually quite low. Um, and in fact, I think given the number of pregnant women who have been infected and developed COVID-19, it would certainly suggest that the, the risk is very low. Um, and so what I would say is, at least in the case of SARS-2, I think the placenta is doing the job it should be doing. And I think for the cases that have been published, they're obviously real cases, but, but I do think they're the exception exception rather than the rule. And as I mentioned, are probably influenced by, you know, any number of factors that may have just been unique to that, you know, infection during pregnancy, be it maternal viremia, you know, response to that. Um, one thing I do think just, in a, and I'll just toss it back to Rich in a second, to note though, is that there's certainly no evidence that that SARS-2 is teratogenic. What we know is that there have been cases of, um, of you know, preterm labor, intrauterine growth restriction, but this virus does not seem to be, you know, like rubella or CMV or Zika, which has very clear teratogenic, you know, potential causing microcephaly, you know, hearing loss, blindness. Um, and so I think the risk is quite low. And I think the reports are, are as I said, likely uh, due to, you know, whatever the unique circumstances of that, those cases were. Uh, so, Carolyn, actually, I have a follow up sure. uh, from myself. Um, how did those how were those cases manifested? Were they uh, actually symptomatic or was this just uh, people looking for infection knowing that the mother was infected? Well, I mean, I think it depends probably on the different reports that are out there. You know, the ones that I'm aware of, of course, you know, once uh, once the pandemic became clear in labor and delivery units, of course, they were following women who were COVID-19 uh, a lot more closely. Obviously, their infants were delivered a little bit differently. Um, and so most of the time, these have been, I think, confirmed cases, you know, in pregnant women in the sense that they were looking for them. Um, but as I said, I, I think... You know, given the million individuals that have been infected and the subset of those that are pregnant women, I'm sure um, a common manifestation of infection. And again, it, it just probably relates to potentially even, you know, the maternal viremia immune response to that infection. Uh, so I have, um, uh, in the absence of uh, questions coming in from the uh, listeners for the time being, I have some uh, questions that came up uh, myself. We didn't... Uh, discuss much about uh, transmission. And I'd be interested to hear from any of the speakers. Uh, so their uh, understanding uh, currently of the main mechanisms of transmission, because among other things, this uh, informs us about uh, appropriate mitigation procedures. So anybody jump in on that? Absolutely, I'll jump in. Um, you know, initially when we first heard about this virus, we were hearing a lot about masks and also about fomites, you know, surface contamination, wash your hands lots of times each day, be careful not to touch your face a lot of the time. And as time has gone on and as studies have come in over the, the months and now tens of millions of cases, it really seems like droplets and aerosol transmission is the biggest risk uh, the driver of the most infections. It's not to say that fomites contaminated surfaces don't lead to some infections, um, but for myself, what I think about in terms of risk mitigation and how I want to interact with the rest of the world, it's really about mask wearing and being smart about limiting my time uh, in indoor spaces with other people who aren't part of my immediate family. Um, obviously, still washing my hands, you know, much more religiously than I would say last year at this time, um, being aware of all those things. But I think despite ongoing questions about what the exact definition of an aerosol and the exact particle size are, uh, what I'm concerned about is uh, inhaling virus particles and being becoming infected through that mechanism. Any other comments? I concur. I think that the this idea of closed uh, spaces with low ventilation is really important. So just like Lisa said, um, I don't think fomites are have shown to be that important in this realm, but um, certainly having aerosol generation, whether it's small or large, is important. And and as um, as Lisa showed in her in her talk, um, people are are symptomat or are shedding virus much earlier than they are symptomatic. And so that's the other angle to this as well, which allows it to spread much better. And, and one of the things we didn't really point out in the in the slides was that for SARS-1, um, 
everyone who was infected essentially got symptoms in the first 48 hours of being infected. And so they were quarantined. Uh, if they got sick, they went to the hospital. Otherwise, they were quarantined at home um, in 2003 when the outbreak was going on for SARS-1. And so that's really what mini what, what eliminated that, out, that virus, uh, um, uh, a large part of these public health measures for quarantine. Whereas for SARS-2, we, we clearly see that there's a huge amount of spread of virus before symptoms occur, if they do occur at all. And so this allows this virus to spread by air travel and by other means, um, people moving around the world very rapidly. And so people can walk around without a mask on um, and not just any symptoms at all, but are still spreading virus very readily. And so um, all of that really leads to this remarkable transmission dynamics we're seeing for SARS-2, which in its, in its transmission doesn't look very different than the seasonal cold coronaviruses. It looks quite similar to what we know. It just is more pathogenic than all the, the seasonal coronaviruses. Excellent. Thank you. So I have a, a question here from uh, a listener uh, who says, it's our experience. Uh, they've experienced, uh, observed a vertical transmission in a newborn uh, from a 35-year-old, I take it, uh, mother uh, with a high fever. And I guess the question is, is, the, uh, is this related to viremia? Uh, does the fever have a, uh, any sort of an impact on this? Carolyn, any thoughts? Yeah, on that? I don't know if you want me to try to take that. I mean, yeah, yeah I think this happens. And so, you know, as I mentioned, I think, I guess what my sort of feel about this is, again, it, it's more of the exception. And so it's possible, certainly, you know, high fever and illness would um, indicate uh, a response to the infection. And, you know, um, that response likely does impact the placenta. I sort of mentioned, I didn't show any of the data, but, you know, there's been work in a mouse model of Zika virus infection, and we've done some of the human studies that, you know, type one interferons, for example, can damage the placenta. And they damage it not necessarily in causing a break in the barrier, but they damage its function. And so often what this could lead to when you think about it are things like intrauterine growth restriction, such that the fetus is not getting the nutrients that it needs to develop, which of course then can lead to preterm uh, to, to preterm birth, or or again, a, a number of different sort of adverse outcomes. And so, um, yeah, I think this certainly does happen. I don't think it happens as the norm. Um, and certainly, you know, a high fever and illness would indicate that there certainly was a, you know, maternal response to that infection that could have altered placenta structure or function. Good, thank you. So I have another uh, question uh, of my own. Back to the uh, uh, topic of transmission, and especially uh, in the context of uh, pediatrics. My sense is that there is a misconception in the population that since children don't get a lot of disease, that they're not actually getting infected, okay? And I'd like to hear comments from, uh, from the panel on uh, any data about the rate of infection in children, whether it's any different than adults, because uh, it's my impression that they get infected and transmit disease, but I'd like to hear from the experts. Um, my Jean-Pierre, I would like to add a question uh, to yeah, your good. question, and uh, that is uh, for uh, Caroline. It is uh, a, a view. It is quite uh, early, but uh, it's been. Uh, there are data that uh, tell us that uh, mother can transmit the protection, even if they cannot can transmit the virus uh, to the to the newborn. I don't know which which you want answered first. I, I don't know that I'm that the the children uh, infection. Uh, we'll come we'll come back to the children infection. Okay. You 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 sure. do that one. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, during pregnancy, you know, the 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 kind of development of passive immunity is formed across the placenta. You know, the 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 maternal um, antibodies are transmitted across the placenta during pregnancy as a, as a mechanism to sort of prime the neonatal response to respond. And so, I think absolutely. I think you know the the maternal response to an infection. Being be it antibodies or otherwise, certainly are there to, to kind of protect um, the neonate and, you know, during during the delivery process. So um, I think those, those you know, phenomena certainly exist and they could be mediated by antibodies or a variety of other factors. Um, you know, actually the, the levels of maternal antibodies are higher in the fetal circulation than they are the maternal circulation in the later stages of pregnancy. Because again, the placenta is really driving the passive transport of a lot of those antibodies. So that could be one mechanism by which that's happening. So Matt or Lisa, do you have any uh, comment on, uh, or any data on infection rates in children? 
So, so it seems like there's been, I'll start, Matt can jump in, uh, you know, somewhat a dearth of testing in children where a lot of people were hoping that maybe Sweden, which stayed open, would have done more testing of school children in, you know, the spring going into the summer that didn't really happen. We're definitely getting more data right now where we're seeing, you know, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools all open and then shut as waves of virus run through them here in the U.S. Uh, thinking about small children, I know there was a case in upstate New York where it was reported that, you know, an asymptomatic child went into their daycare and, you know, the virus kind of spread through the daycare wildly. And, in, you know, there were secondary cases where, you know, the other little kids then infected their family members. So children can definitely be infected and transmit the virus, even if they're not particularly symptomatic themselves. You know, leading into the start of the school year, there were a lot of memes going around, you know, different parts of the internet where, you know, pictures of sending your kid off to school wearing, you know, maybe a Spider-Man mask and then them coming home in the afternoon saying like, oh, well, I have an X-Man mask now because, you know, Tommy, <laughs> the next desk over had a cooler one, so we traded. So especially with younger kids, they're not going to understand the social distancing, uh, you know, their hands, mouths everywhere, depending on the age. So you can imagine that if there's virus there, it's going to transmit very readily, even if the kids themselves don't display symptoms. Yeah, I think just to, to add to that, too, the, the big worry also is that the kids get infected, you know, and then they infect older adults, which are maybe more um, have more uh, propensity for severe disease and death. So whether it's teachers that are in the schools or whether it's uh, uh, parents and grandparents and other um, you know, older people at home. So, I mean, this is the big worry. We also don't really understand a lot about what this disease does in kids. Um, as there, there isn't that much testing, so we don't really know what the, the denominator is for the number of kids that are actually positive. And then we don't know really um, the really spectrum of disease that we see. And there's, uh, as Lisa showed, there's this, uh, MISC inflammatory disease that's been shown in kids. Um, and, you know, as kids go back to school, they're going to be infected um, and um, we're going to see this spread. And so just like any cold virus, you know, that spreads incredibly well, like just in these clo in these settings, um, not all schools can be set up outside. Not all schools have, uh, uh, probably most schools don't have very good airflow in general. And so all of this leads to rampant infection and, and um, this is what everyone is holding out for vaccination campaigns where we can now start vaccinating adults and kids to try to limit the amount of virus in the community. And especially in the US and a lot of, you know, especially across Europe, we're not doing very good at controlling this population wide and the, the amount of virus that's there. Um, and until we do that, we're still gonna see these rampant infections. Thank you. So we have a question uh, from one of our participants for uh, uh, Dr. Grolinski or and Dr. DeCaro. Uh, asking to, uh, methods, do you think that washing hands with simple soap is enough? Or, uh, and do you think that the uh, sort of use of anti-infective detergents is uh, being abused by that, I think, overemphasized, okay? So in terms of hand hygiene, what's the yes. best practice? Washing your hands with regular old soap and water and, you know, getting a nice foamy lather, washing your hands for that 20, 30 seconds is going to do a great job in inactivating coronavirus. Matt did a really good job talking about the lipid envelope that surrounds the, you know, that makes up the virion. And it's inc actually incredibly fragile and very easy to destroy and inactivate, or if we want to say kill the virus. Um, we're lucky in that sense, we're not dealing with a norovirus that requires bleach or something. Uh, regular old soap and water will do a great job. Uh, you know, antimicrobial agents in soap are definitely a big thing. They look great on labels and I think that they're probably overused and they're definitely not doing anything to help you uh, fight this coronavirus. Any further comment, Dr. DeCaro? Yeah, I really agree. I think that uh, the frequency that uh, you are doing it, uh, the way that uh, you are doing it uh, in order to be pro a proper washing, it is better that uh, use uh, stronger or uh, ad uh, uh, strongly advertised uh, uh, disinfectant that, uh, that can destroy everything. It is an envelope virus. Uh, even if uh, you can find literature on, in the media, uh, 
sometimes news that, that say that it can persist for longer time that we think. I still think that good washing with good soap will work a lot, a lot. Okay, so I have another question, uh, I think directed mostly uh, towards Lisa, but of course anybody else can uh, uh, jump in, uh, about clotting. Because uh, some of the discussion that I've uh, heard leads me to suspect uh, that there may be clotting issues even uh, on a almost a microscopic scale uh, in the lungs and very early in disease. And I'm wondering whether this might not be uh, a more primary cause of some of the issues that are being observed uh, rather than a sequela, okay? And whether that's really not primary in the pathogenesis rather than a, a rare or a sequela outcome. Do you have any comment on that? I think that's a good point and one that's very much an open question. Like we know we're seeing a lot of coagulopathies and weird kind of unexpected higher numbers of thrombotic events than we expect. And some of them are, you know, large events. And they're also seeing a lot of microthrombi in the lung and in tissues really throughout the body. But that's part of where we're limited with autopsies and biopsies from humans. And so we don't get samples from patients with mild disease or early disease. And so I think development of effective representative animal models there will let us ask more questions. An animal model is only as good as it reflects human disease. So you still need to be able to compare and you know validate your model as much as possible. But that's when we can you know, maybe not with monkeys because they're very expensive and they're limited and there are more ethical considerations, but with, you know, smaller animal models, look at day one, day two, day three, day four, these time points that you never get with people. Um, but the systemic effects and the, the weird sequelae and long-term impacts of disease, you know, it would make a lot of sense if there were these kind of microthrombi events throughout the body that are impacting this. So along the same lines, uh, Lisa, um, the systemic effects that are being observed, uh, are they a result of um, virus actually becoming systemic uh, and causing uh, pathology outside the lung? Or does it have to do with pathology that originates in the lung that is systemic because it involves uh, circulatory molecules of one sort or another? This, I think, is a pretty hot question. There are a lot of big researchers getting a lot of attention right now looking for any sign of infection, virus, hopefully replicating virus in non-pulmonary tissues, non-epithelial cells. And there have been some pretty big papers that I'm not always so impressed by. You can find viral nucleic acid pretty widely disseminated throughout the body, but that doesn't mean that you have replicating virus. Um, you know, macrophages might engulf virions and travel with them somewhere. Uh, but the site of primary replication really does seem to be the lung and to a certain extent, I think the GI tract. Uh, the cardiomyocytes can be infected in culture how much this happens in people is, is a little bit less clear. Um, neuronal cells, uh, endothelial cells as opposed to epithelial cells, there's a limited amount of evidence for a number of these, but I think uh, that's not where the bulk of replication is happening. When I think of the systemic effects of disease, I think about uh, inflammation and uh, cytokines, chemokines that are starting off in the lung and then going out through the rest of the body and really causing the bulk of disease that way. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so I have okay. another question. Oh, excuse me. Okay, I would like to add that, that we too in our institute to make some research in order to, to see if there is uh, at least uh, um, a good amount of virus in organs that are different for pulmonary. And just also started at the beginning, one observation was that in blood you don't find the virus. It is really, really exceptional. And this was useful because we can set up some reduced biosafety rule to process in the blood of the infected people. And we also studied some autopsy and make 
you can find the, the RNA, but uh, I agree. It, it doesn't mean that you have uh, um, a real replication. It is different from other viruses of the touch system. Okay, really different. Uh, so I have, uh, once again, some of my own questions about uh, immunity. Uh, I'm interested in um, sort of the strength of the immune response. It's, this, this is sort of a two-part question. Uh, my uh, sense is that, at least in the uh, case of some of the reinfections, some of this might be due to a fairly mild immune response to start with. And th could this be related to... Uh, say a lower inoculum or a, uh, not a very serious disease, and could this impact on reinfection? And I'm, I'm also interested in ultimately in a, a good immune response, what's known about the correlates of protection and how that relates to vaccines, for example, because all the vaccines are strictly to spike. Uh, should we uh, be uh, looking at other antigens uh, how important is the T cell response? So can anybody comment on any of those issues? Okay, I'll start and I, Lisa can jump, sure jump in when you correct me. Um, so I, for the reinfection idea, um, uh, I think, you know, the word, while there is, you know, maybe a dozen of these cases so far in the world that people have identified, um, I really don't think it's going to be a widespread issue. Um, the people who are be reinfected uh, probably have some immune dysfunction issue, which is maybe underlying a lot of their syndromes, whether it's an MHC um, cross match allele or some other issue where you're not getting good presentation of the initial uh, um, peptides for some reason across SARS-2. I think it's probably what we're seeing there. Um, easily could have been that their initial infection was too mild to generate a really uh, reasonably strong um, a, a neighbor, I mean, a adaptive response and antibody level. It's hard to know whether that's true or not because we don't have a lot of samples from these early cases. Um, maybe as the vaccine trials roll out and there's, you know, 20, 30,000 people will have the, in the trials, we'll have this really broad spectrum of response across people. And the lower responding people uh, in the trials can be kind of parsed out separately. We can understand, do more research on those people versus the high um, the people who generate high antibodies. And, and we know this is true for every vaccine. You get this wide spectrum of response. There's people in the, every year, the med students that come to University of Maryland School of Medicine, they have to get um, uh, their MMR titers uh, before they start school. And we have, we have a handful of people, you know, six to 10 people every year when they start, before they go into the clinic, they have no measles antibodies. And um, they, get, they get hit again with a vaccine, and a third of them still don't get generated response. It's just inherently immunogenetic differences between people that leads to this. So I think the reinfection part is um, is really probably due to that. Uh, we, we really don't know anything yet. Um, for the, the vaccine targeting part about why we're targeting a spike, um, I know you talk about a lot on this on TWIV and I wanted to write you an email, but I never have. So I'll tell you now, my view of it at least. Um, so, uh, what we know from SARS-1 is that, um, and MERS and all the other coronaviruses, is that if you target spike, you can generate neutralizing antibodies and those are protective. Um, there are other viral proteins that you can get um, that are antigenic and you get T cell responses to, but they are generally non-protective antibody responses. And so um, what, when I, so Lisa and I share a common history in the Ralph Barracks lab at UNC, uh, what they had shown um, now uh, 10, 15 years ago, was that for SARS-1, if you vaccinate a mouse with nucleocapsid, with N, um, and you challenge that animal with spike, with SARS-1, you get a worse response than you do with just SARS alone. And you get this enhanced eosinophilic response, which is non-protective against infection. You get the same thing, actually, if you have a, a whole doubly inactivated virion, so it has the, it's the entire virus that's inactivated and you vaccinate mice with that, and then you infect with SARS-1, you get the same eosinophilic response. That's how they tracked it down to N. So um, I think that the spike is clearly the immunodominant antigen is where the antibody should be targeted to. Um, and N, or even the whole virus vaccines, I think are, are, are really poor targets to use or poor, um, poor antigen to use when you're looking at a vaccine response. Uh, 